may just watch. Okay, we're going live. Okay, here we go. Is there anybody I know? Okay. Getting ready to go, that's okay. Well, hello there, and welcome to Skyter Livestream. This is Mark D'Antonio here with Daryl Mason. Hey, Daryl, how's it going? Hello, Mark. I'm well. How are you? Oh, just fine, thank you. And uh, Daryl and I are here again tonight. Um, we actually did a private stream yesterday to try and check out a few things, work out some sound issues, and I believe we have done so. So, uh, hi there to Cypher. Hi, Headband Harvest. What's going on? And Do W is here. Nice to see you. And Daisy and Zoe. It's nice to see you guys with us. Uh, you know, it's fun to see who shows up right at the very beginning. I like that a lot. PG is here as well. That's Petita. She's off in Pennsylvania. Uh, and uh, met her at Pine Bush. And she has one of our books. And I hate to put her on the spot, but PG, did you start reading the book yet? Just, just asking. <laughs> uh, so uh, tonight, uh, it looks like we're going to have a, a good time. It should be fun. Um, we're going to go as long as we can. There might be some clouds about, but um, shouldn't be that bad. Uh, and uh, but we'll we'll see. Um, we have our camera up and ready. We have our system here ready to go. This is our system that we're using to uh, check out the evening sky. Can I say something and real quick? You may. Okay. Uh, you see Venus over there in the southwest after sunset, folks. You may notice that Venus has gone all the way through and past the uh, teapot now. That's the handle of the teapot just above the horizon. And so Venus is about to, is moving toward Capricorn now. And if you look to their upper left, you see Jupiter and Saturn uh, in a line. They're almost evenly spaced. And Jupiter and Saturn are going to be dropping into the southwest. And the three planets are going to be coming closer and closer together in the coming weeks. It should make for a really, really pretty view. I think that's going to be a beautiful be a view. Decent, decent conjunction. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for indulging me. No, not at all. That That's... You know, Part of the reason that you're here is because you offer those wonderful things. Thank you for those observations. Um, so uh, I was focusing on getting all the equipment up and running, and uh, our telescope is up and running. We have our cooler. As you can see, it's, it's a minus 10 degrees Celsius, so it's super cooled. Uh, this is our camera control panel over here on the right side. Okay, That controls all the aspects of the camera. And up above here is the telescope in the building right there. And then up on top is the telescope control system. So you have telescope on the left, camera on the right. right? And uh, that's uh, a, very good, uh, a very good setup for us because it allows us to, to uh, take care of uh, things sort of in a modular manner. We don't have to worry too much about things. Okay, 
So that said, uh, in the camera controls, I want to make a, a just a little observation here for you. Okay, if you come over here and look, all right, we see this this right here. This is the exposure. That's how long we're exposing this image for. Right now, it's at a thousand milliseconds. That's one second. So we're taking one second exposures every second, and you're seeing it on the screen. That's what you're seeing down below here in the main view. But the most important uh, field next to that one is this one here called gain. Gain is very important because the gain is sort of like the sensitivity uh, of the sensor. And right now, like when you look at a, a regular camera, okay, a regular camera can have a gain of, um, you know, 400, 800, 1200, 8000 even, okay. This doesn't correspond to the same value system there. So it's not just a, a gain of 325 that we see here, okay. So that's, that's not what we're looking at, okay. We're actually looking at uh, a gain of probably uh, well over a hundred thousand, maybe even higher. So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. So we take all of our pictures at 350 and below, and tonight we're going to do it at 325. We took some beautiful images. Let's go down here. Wee! Whoa! Hey! We took a few beautiful images last night uh, just to test a few of our our elements, uh, and the pictures came out beautiful. You can go up to the server. We have a free public server where all of our images go. And you drill down, uh, and, and when you go into the uh, processed directory, you'll actually see all of the uh, pictures straight out of the camera that have some processing done to them. And then over time, I'm backfilling those with further processed imagery for you as well. So it's always there available for you. Then I also have the stacks up there, because what we're doing is we're stacking these images one on top of each other and taking photographs like that. And uh, when we do that, you'll see... A live stack along the bottom here which uh, we don't see right now but as an example uh, the first thing we do typically when we when we head into the sky here is we go to some place where we can actually check out uh, an object of interest to just check our focus and tonight we're gonna do this like we did yesterday we'll do M2 measure 2 as a globular cluster and you watch over my head you'll see the telescope start to move okay so uh, here goes the telescope. It's starting to move. And the way the telescope finds these objects is it doesn't go straight to the object. It goes to a bright star near the object. And it centers that bright star. It's called high precision slewing. You see that right here. Okay. This high precision system is going to uh, uh, bring the telescope to a bright star, which is going to bring into the field here and center it up. And then from there, it's going to go right to this this object, as you'll see. So here comes our bright star, all right? And the star that it is is uh, centering is called Sad al Sud, and it's putting it right there in the middle. And then our globular cluster is gonna end up right exactly where this pointer is. And I'll even leave that pointer there uh, as I'm convinced it's gonna be perfect. So uh, now once it centers it up, all right, it then runs right off and here comes the globular cluster and it puts it in, uh, okay, so it's not exactly where it was, but it's very, very close. Oh, wait, uh, okay, well, we're probably, we're almost exactly correct. Okay, so there we go. That is uh, the globular cluster now. This is measure two. You saw how fast that was, and it's going to take that kind of time throughout the night as we go to these different objects. If you look over my head, you can see the telescope is pointing kind of that way. Okay, it's actually pointing toward the west, which is that way, and toward the south, which is this way, you know, over my head toward the back, okay? That way is north, and that way is east. So the back of the observatory that you see right there in the back area, that's actually toward the north, uh, and that side of the observatory wall is toward the east. This is to the south, toward me, and then that's west, so southwest is that way. So pretty cool, yeah. and we got a... M2, yep. I'm sorry, pardon me. Uh, M2, what constellation is it in? You asking? I am. Oh, um, I'm not sure, but I have to get the boundaries here to make sure that I know the answer to that. Okay, okay uh, the, uh, that's uh, Aquarius. Aquarius, yes. That's right. I knew that and forgot it. I thought the people might like to know. Yeah. And to figure that out, sometimes what we do is we actually we actually uh, check one of the stars inside the constellation boundary from which this is in, 
and you'll see this AQR that stands for a query uh, so 34 a query that's this star that we're on right now there and here is where we are we're on measure 2 and um, just to get an idea how that works uh, we're gonna center it up and then bring up the measured field which shows the size of our telescope field as it relates to measure 2 so if measure 2 is in the center of our field all right it's not quite but I will move it there uh, and I will do that by changing our speed you'll see our the speed right there I'm changing it down to uh, 16 X 16 times guiding speed is what that means and then we're going to move the telescope to the west a little bit and that's going to bring measure 2 in the middle here all right okay so now, if I come back here, we can adjust for any inconsistencies. Okay. Um, so there's measure two. And uh, there's our, that's where it thinks our telescope is. So telescope is off a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sync up the telescope to this location. And that's going to fix the connection between the telescope and the program. But it doesn't change anything at the telescope. The telescope knows where it is, but the program was off a little bit. So now it's lined up. And we do that a couple times through the night just to keep this program on the straight and narrow. Uh, so that's how that works. And I want to say hi to Rockstar and to Leslie Latin Taylor. Hello there. Welcome to Skyter Livestream tonight. How are you guys doing? All right. So now. Uh, when we have this sitting here, what we can do is we can actually zoom in on it. So I'm going to take us in. Uh, I'll take us to 100% and just check out the quality of the image. Okay. And as you look at this, you can see that the stars aren't quite focused. And so uh, what we want to do is we want to try and sharpen those up a little bit. So I'm going to take us... Uh, uh, take us, let me do this, let's do, uh, this is 48.262, that actually worked yesterday quite well for the temperature. Yeah, focus is temperature dependent. Yeah, focus is Pretty temperature good. dependent. So, there. yeah, so let's try uh, 418 and see if this works. We could go anywhere in between. Okay. All right, so 418 looks a little bit better. Uh, and I'm going to try 518 to see how that looks. It's a little bit farther along. Let's see what that does. Okay. Well, that looks even better, doesn't it? Uh. So right now as the temperature gets better or, or lower it'll will change that it'll will send it back to, that will be pulling back on the focus as the night wears on okay so we always try to do the focus first hey there Keith how you doing Keith from PK space imaging if you haven't joined you got to do that because they have the most amazing moon shots and planetary shots indeed okay <clears throat> gonna do a stack on this one I could I mean you're I live could. video right now right yeah this is live as you can see the frames are updating yeah All right, so 48 550 seems to uh, be a good place right here so what we're gonna do is forty-eight five fifty. all right there we go. Okay. And now let's, uh, we're going to back down to about 50% of the field size. This is the size of the sensor. All right. So this, this, when we go to hundred percent, that's the native size. So anything less than that is, is, uh, is good too. Hi, Isabella. Well, Keith, tonight what we're going to do is we're going to look at some neat dark objects. Uh, we don't have a moon, so uh, Daryl, I think you'll be able to dig up some dark nebulae for us to look at too, as well as me. And we'll we'll have some fun looking at some dark clouds in the universe. Okay. 
Okay, I guess I have something to work on now. Sure. I'm doing a few things here, so hopefully you can do that as well. Yeah. All right, I'm going to live stack this now. This is just a bunch of one second shots. And we'll see what it looks like. Oh, I think I have my... I gotta get rid of this guy. There we go. Ooh, there we go. Look at that. That's really pretty. Now, the color's not right, of course. So what we have to do is fix the color. So I'm gonna balance color right now. Hello, Preston Paget. How are you? Alright, let me do this again. That's a beautiful globular. It is. Indeed it is. M2 is an awful long ways from uh, M1 Crab. Uh, kind of surprised yeah. it took Messier so long to uh, find number two. I know. I wonder if he renumbered them um, later on. I guess we hmm. could never really know that. You know? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I'm sure it was a hit and miss kind of thing back then. Yeah, maybe. You see some parts of the sky, uh, sort of like NGC objects nowadays, you know, which I, if I remember correctly, tend to run in uh, rising right ascension. But uh, yeah, uh, the Messier list kind of seems to follow something of that idea. Uh, especially later on in the list. Yeah. Some of that, too, might be where uh, also when he got into the list, other people were contributing to the list. Yeah, that's probably true. All right. Let's, let's bring this over a little bit. Here we go. Oh, wrong place. Okay. I hope you guys are enjoying uh, so far. These globular clusters are really interesting because they're called halo objects in our galaxy. They actually go around the whole galaxy. They orbit the galaxy. So some of them plunge through the galactic disk. Some of them are outside the galactic disk. Uh, the really distant ones are outside the galactic disk. So there's a lot going on. When I did my thesis in astronomy, um, I did it on what are called runaway B stars. And these are B stars, that is to say, very hot young stars that are speeding out of the galaxy. And they would normally be born in a cluster inside of a nebula, okay, like the Lagoon Nebula or the Orion Nebula. And then over time, that nebula would be dispersed by the hot stellar winds of these young hot stars. And when that happened, sometimes gravitational interactions with the, uh, uh, with the uh, other stars in the area could cause it to, could cause these to go uh, through a gravitational whip and send them right on out of the galaxy. Um, but one of the other possibilities, which is kind of interesting, is that this particular uh, set of uh, uh, halo objects, these globular clusters that surround our galaxy, these could have actually caused um, a problem where when they come through the disk and they plunge through the disk, they drag stars with them. I mean, look at them. They're gigantic gravitational wells, right? And these would bring a whole bunch of uh, uh, stars with them, drag them along. So, maybe... It's possible that they're responsible for uh, some of this, uh, these these runaway stars. We do not know. DW asks, which theory is better, expansion or collapse? Well, right now, do um, we're on? I I am I'm actually on the side of expansion because we rec we recognize that the universe is expanding. In fact, the universe is doing something really strange. 
it's not just expanding from the Big Bang, it's accelerating as it expands. And that acceleration goes and runs contrary to our understanding of, uh, you know, uh, universal laws of physics that, that, that we adhere to. So uh, that's where the concept of dark energy came from. Uh, a hitherto unseen and still seen, not seen, only indirectly, uh, energy that, that, that is a repulsive force that pushes everything else away from everything else. Um, kind of like if you had a balloon and you blew it up a little bit and you put dots all over it. And when you blew it up more, every dot would move away from every other dot on that balloon. Um, so the balloon is like dark energy. Uh, and if that's the case, that could be responsible for the acceleration that we're viewing. Um, my personal feeling is I think there's something else going on, and I'm not sure that I really buy the whole dark energy concept personally. I think that dark matter, however, uh, can exist. Dark energy, on the other hand, is a wholly different thing. Very, It's created for a very different reason. Right now, it's a placeholder until we understand what's really going on. So the universe is expanding, in my view. Focus looks good, oh, yeah. Daryl. Look at that. Sorry, I was uh, looking for something. Yes, right. that's great. Uh, uh, Lewis asked if there's a black hole in M2. I did a quick search and uh, saw no mention of one. Uh, when Messier discovered M2 here, uh, his little telescope couldn't resolve it into stars. Uh, William Herschel did resolve it into stars. So you could he could almost claim it as much or more as... Uh, Messier could. Yeah. Yeah. It's one of the larger global clusters. Old yeah, too. This... 13 billion years old. Oh. And that says something to the types of stars we see in this cluster. Um, these are not young stars we're looking at. We're looking at old stars. And that means that they were formed at a time when the universe had very few other elements in it. Things like magnesium and calcium and krypton and 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 uh potassium and silicon and and so forth this was at a time when the stars had very little more than hydrogen and helium in them and that means that most likely in, in, in nearly all the cases unless the globular clusters pull stars along with them when they come through the disk on some occasions uh most of the stars in these globular clusters will never have planets because there's not enough material there to actually have created uh, any planets at any time. I'm just, I'm loving the view, to be honest with you. It's a nice still night. We're stacking and we're not getting any budging whatsoever. It looks gorgeous. We've probably stacked, uh, gosh, we've, you know how many we've stacked? Ready for this? 287. <laughs> wow. Yeah, because oh, we're doing good. one second shots and one second exposures. Oh. So I'm going to just pause this. And I will save it. Uh, this will be the first entry in our live server for tonight. You okay. You need to look at next, don't you? Oh, I suspect you're going to tell me. Well, you're in the neighborhood. I know. Uh, NGC 253. Yeah. Yep, yeah, sure I think that... A little to the east of where you are. All right. We're going to go there, uh, and it should be, it should actually be uh, easily visible. All right, one thing I do, we have these, uh, we have the, uh, let me just go back to this for a second. I think we're on one second exposures, but I want to give us uh, our hyper view. We're going we're to do this over processed view so we can actually see the sky. And we're actually zoomed in here. I'm going to zoom out. Uh, to uh, fill the frame with the entire frame. What this does is it gives us our whole view. So this is two degrees across and one and a half degrees tall. What does that mean? It means four full moons across and three full moons tall. That's the size of our field. Whoa, hey, look at that. Welcome. <laughs> that was a fast moving satellite. That's a low Earth orbit satellite for sure. Okay. Anything about DART? Yeah, actually, no, but how you doing there, uh, Uh It's, um, 
Dart was launched. I don't know the status of it right now, uh, it, it, what, what its orbit is and what its insertion orbit is going to be to send it on its path. Uh, that's, uh, it's probably going to do a, a, a variation of a home and transfer, it's called, to get it out of our neighborhood and send it out into the uh, toward the asteroid belt or where it's going. I'm not sure if it's going to uh, the Trojan asteroids or if it's going to our asteroid belt, um, you know, further out past Mars. I'm not sure. Interesting. I watched them launch. Uh, and yep. They launched it in a polar orbit, so it's uh, heading out of. The, I would have to guess it's heading out of the uh, plane of the solar system. Yeah, higher, perhaps. Higher low, you know. Yeah. Kathleen Solway Kessel, how are you? It's nice to see you. From Kent, Connecticut. I'm in Terryville, Connecticut, operating a telescope that's out in the Arizona desert. So we're actually, you know. Just, uh, we're all over the place, aren't we? <laughs> uh, and, uh, okay, uh, let's see, who is it? Oh, uh, Preston asked a question. Could it be information causing the expansion of the universe? Um, interesting question, Preston, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'd want you to define information for us just a little bit more. Um, so I'll wait for you to define that. All right. Now we're gonna. Uh, while we're waiting, I'm gonna actually go and because we're out. Zoom, we're zoomed out. We're at one second exposures. Uh, we're going to go to NGC 253, which is uh, a galaxy. We've been looking at it before. It's also known as the Sculptor Galaxy, and, and it's really the Silver Dollar Galaxy. And this uh, it was. It's called the Silver Dollar? I thought the Silver Dollar yeah. was a different galaxy. Hmm. Just another colloquial okay. name for it. Yeah, I guess so. Alright. It's uh, kind of low, but let's see how high it can get. I think it's about as high as it's going to get, actually. So we're, we're, we're going to have to... It can go a little higher soon, but um, we will... I think we'll get there. We're in the neighborhood. So let's go here and let's let's get rid of our full screen here so that we can actually watch the whole screen, watch all the information, watch the telescope, watch the controls. And then let's go back to our control program and tell it to get along, little doggy, and go there. So here we go. We're telling it to go right now. So watch the telescope. You'll see the telescope move. There it goes. The telescope's looking for a star, and what star is it? I don't know. Pick a star, any star. And Dipta. it's it's probably Dipta, yes, because it finds it found Dipta last time. Yeah, and that's probably Dipta right there. Dipta is a bright star near this particular galaxy, and uh, yeah, it looks like Dipta. Yep. So as we as we get closer, okay. Dipta. It's also known as Den of Kaitos, which means tail of the whale. Mm-hmm. Cetus the whale. Yes. So as we uh, center up on Dipta, okay, then we're going to move and go straight to the galaxy, which is right there. Yes. A galaxy that, in a sense, it rivals the Andromeda galaxy because of its detail that we can see. Um... So that's going to be kind of cool, and we might have a tiny bit of interference with the building right here, but maybe not. We're actually working on, uh, I actually have to order them. We're getting what are called lifting columns, and the telescopes are going to be mounted on lifting columns that lift it up 20 inches. So we're going to be clear of the walls and be able to see right down to the horizon. And we can even see trees on the horizon and, and cactus if we uh, play our cards right. So it might be kind of fun. Um, but that's just for purposes of uh, being able to utilize all of the capabilities of the telescope. Uh, seeing to the horizon with a telescope is never a good idea. You don't see the objects very clearly. You see them through more air, and they look less less well. But this is such a beautiful location um, that it quickly has proven that it can actually look pretty nice out there. So, all right, here we are. This is the... Sculptor Galaxy, and we're going to stack this one as well, but we're not going to do one second exposures. We're going to do 15 second exposures on this one. All right. 
and then we're going to stack it. So we're going to live stack this and clear the last one, which is a globular cluster. And this gray, uh, green uh, scale tells us how long the exposure is going to take. You can see it down here. Okay, when it reaches full, then we see the first image, and there it is. And now what we do is we um, process a little bit and get the color processed right. All right, and let's go back and let's get this. All right, we're going to drop this down too. Preston answered your question about what he meant by information. Oh, information is everything from our thoughts and dreams to the information of every atom molecule in the universe at its most basic level. You know what? I can tell you right now, um, uh, as an astronomer, one of the things that I used to think is that, you know, the universe is only the things we can see and understand and that the things we can't see and understand are just another bit of physics to, to learn. Uh, I've, I've actually changed my tune on that a little bit based on other things I've seen and experienced. So um, I won't say that what you're asking about is something that's, that's nonsense at all. I think that it remains to be seen. Um, and just because there's no true evidence for it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I'll give you an example why. Um, that example has to do with something called quantum entanglement. Now, Preston may know about this. I'm sure he does. Hi, Louis Ta. And I think that um, if we think about how quantum entanglement works, okay, this is my squid tentacle iPhone uh, stand. If I break this apart and I take one half and I put it in laboratory A and one half and put it in laboratory B and I change the electron spin a characteristic of electrons, which can be up or down. If I change it in one side, on one side's electrons, then I don't have to measure the spin of the other electrons to know that they're not spin up anymore, more, they're spin down. So if I change these to spin up from spin down, this guy's will be spin down. They'll be the opposite, and it'll change, okay? And that happens no matter how far apart these things are. And it has to do with how and when you measure. So what are we doing? We're measuring to get what? Information, just like you were suggesting, Preston. So um, I think to say it causes the expansion uh, might be limiting what you suggested. I think that maybe this information, this quantum entanglement that the universe seems to be um, uh, full of, uh, or the universe seems to be full of, uh, could not only just explain expansion but maybe the universe as a whole uh there's a lot going on here that we don't get no don't understand okay just like this galaxy I, right here go ahead i could counter that a little bit uh uh if you know what entropy is i believe uh i've seen that uh entropy is sometimes explained as loss of information uh it okay i mean yes it can be if you consider entropy chaos, right? Because chaos, by definition, is lack of order. And lack of order can translate to lack of information about the system. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't say that that's an incorrect statement myself. I think you could be right about that, Daryl. Yeah. Let's look at NGC 253. Yeah, look at that, huh? That's shaping up nicely. Yeah, it is. This uh, since uh, since I got out to the the building and I worked on this telescope, uh, we've gotten quite a bit, uh, quite a bit better imagery. I, I should say quite a bit. Uh, I should say a thousand percent better, actually. Um, and it's just absolutely stunning. You know. Mm -hmm. So let's just. Let's do this. Okay, now let's zoom in more. Okay, so you can see a little bit more. What are we looking at? We're looking at this. Ready? Boom. Yeah. This is a galaxy. And if you notice, you can see these spiral arms outlined by these dark, these dark lanes. These are called dark lanes. Kind of like you, Lane watching but l-a-n-e not l-a-i-n-e 
And these dark lanes are very interesting because they actually uh, house all this dark dust. And it just so happens that the dark dust sort of outlines the spiral arms. The spiral arms are where new stars are, are born and where older stars that are more massive will die and explode, releasing said dark dust back into the universe, creating the dark lanes that we see. Okay, so we know this is a mature galaxy because there's tons of dark lanes in it, um, for sure. And you notice that the stars near the middle are older. They're kind of a, a yellow stars. And the ones in the disk are young and hot because that's where, that's where the stars form is in the disks of these galaxies. Uh, but this is just pretty as heck, I'm telling you. And there's one thing more I can do here. I can actually increase the sharpness of this by adding a on-the-fly uh, enhancement, which we'll do right now. We're going to add an enhancement here. If you watch the screen, you'll see the galaxy get a little sharper. Okay, now it just got a lot sharper right there. I don't know if you can see that. I'm going to bring this up a little bit to see it happen here. Hey, Tina Hamilton. Thanks for coming in. It's very nice to see you here. Um, we always welcome everybody. If you haven't subscribed, please do, okay? Love to have you. It's always free. Um, and so this is a beautiful, uh, beautiful galaxy. Day. Yeah, this is a great night. It's a great night. What do you think, Daryl? What do you think of this galaxy? Looks good, huh? I think it's great. Yeah. I'm going to um, go back to the histogram tab here. And I am going to thank you, uh, PG. I'm going to just drop out a little bit of the green to let that blue come back. Because that's more blue. Okay. <clears throat> oh, you're welcome, Preston. I, again, you know, and the reason that you know Preston says that uh, you know the he says the explanations are easy to understand yes <clears throat> and it's it's very complex subjects that uh, are are that, that we try to make easy because I believe science is within reach of everybody not everybody can know quantum mechanics not everybody can know you know Newtonian kinematics or celestial mechanics <clears throat> but you know something everybody can understand how planets orbit, how planets rotate around stars, how galaxies rotate, as long as it's brought down within reach from what they understand, because not everybody understands, you know, the physics of all this. But you can understand what's going on, and that's what SkyTour Livestream is. That's what I do. I try to make sure that you can understand it at a level that allows you to dig a little deeper if you want to. You know, and I think that's, that's kind of cool. I, I appreciate that comment. Thank you very much, Preston. Notice how yellow the center of the galaxy is. Yeah, those how stars are older. It's in, out in the outskirts. Yeah, I uh, just color corrected it to be more like what it really is. And you'll notice that the you can see this definition better. We see this in the Andromeda galaxy as well. You know, the spiral arms where the stars are formed. When stars are formed, they're typically hot and young. What does hot correspond to? Hot corresponds to blue and white stars. So that's what's out there. The center of the galaxy has older stars, you know, and uh, that's that's pretty interesting, you know. But we're seeing a beautiful image here. This, uh, how many do we stack here? We've got thirty-four stacked already. So that means, and what I do is, we're going to pause this here. We're going to save the stack, and when I hit save, you'll see across the top a green line, and it says the stack has been saved as a FITS file. FITS file, that's a, a astronomical format, and you'll say, well, I can't do anything with that. No, you could if you got the, the proper uh, viewer. There's a FITS viewer program that will allow you to look at it. But the processed photo, what you're seeing right here on the screen, is what I'm actually saving now. So if you want to get just that, you can go to our live server and take this image. It'll be up there in just a few minutes. 
that's what's so cool about Sky Two live stream. We actually these images are available within seconds of being taken. I think that's so cool. So there we go. Well, I think that's a, a, a beautiful one. So I think um, I think we should go to something else now, don't you? Go for it. Yeah. So let's go back and bring us down from 15 seconds to one second again. And give us a hyper process view. And we'll back out to fill the screen and fit the very, very large field to the size of the image here. All right, so now we jump back in. Let me bring this up a little bit. <clears throat> Now we come back to here. I still I want you know what I want to get to before it's gone completely. I'd like to get to um, I'd like to get to the veil one more time. Oh sure, I forgot. Sorry, yeah. yeah. No, Cygnus, that's fine. I think Cygnus is westering after sunset and uh, uh -huh. grab it early. Yeah, I want to get it while while we can. So it's going to be uh, it's over here. I want to get over here. It's right about here. There it is. That's what I want. Eastern Veil. And it's still going to be 55 degrees above the horizon. So we have plenty of time. So let's go there. Telescope's going to shift to all the way to the other side of the sky, guys. Here we go. And we'll just come back in here and watch the artwork. It kind of looks like art when it moves to the other side of the sky. You can see the telescope moving over my head. Okay. And when Daryl's saying Cygnus is westering, it's actually toward the west, which is that way. And then we are going to put a star, a bright star in here. It's precision slewing to a star. And here's the star. And... Um, for the veil, it might be going to uh, one of the. Yeah, the veil after collimation is going to be awesome, Isabella. Okay, Gianna. Gianna Cygnus. And Cygnus, okay. So now, from here, uh, you'll see the. Isn't this fun watching it live? This is so cool watching a telescope live. And now we're heading to the veil, and you'll see it. There it is. There it is. The beautiful veil and a satellite. <laughs> okay. So there we go. That is the beautiful eastern veil. And we're just going to bring that up into the field of view here. All right. I'm going to move it over, too, because part of the veil that I want to see is the central veil and so it there's an eastern veil okay there's a central veil and then there's a western veil which is spindly and i'd like to show you that too so what we're going to do is we're going to actually move the telescope a little bit to the west okay and you'll see why because once i move it the the central veil is very very dim relative to this guy but it's bright enough to be seen and so we're gonna we're gonna see it <clears throat> you can start to see a little bit of it here all right so and you'll notice the colors and I wasn't gonna talk about the colors yet but they the colors of the veil are just beautiful they're, they're a beautiful red they're a beautiful uh, greenish blue and that greenish blue is the light of oxygen atoms that are caused to glow. This is a supernova remnant. It's the remnant of an exploded star. And uh, this should be good right here. So we'll see some of this over here. All right. Now we're going to do this. We're going to make this a 45 second exposure. All right. And there we go. We're off. And we're going to stack it. Prepare to have your socks blown off on this one this is one of those ones that makes you just like lose your 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 breath you'll actually go ah oh. all right i can promise 
So I'll wait for the first one to come in. Actually, I can I can do this and then bring it back. So you'll see it mostly full screen here. And then I'll adjust colors as necessary. Our green bar indicates how much is is left in the exposure. Okay. Here we come. Get ready. Ready for the beauty of the universe right here. Boom. Wow. Now that is beautiful. And what we'll do is just do a little bit of processing on this, pre-processing. Okay, there we go. And then process this. Okay, all right, guys. This is what you've been waiting for, let me tell you. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? There's that face profile again, too. <laughs> That's right. It's like Alfred Hitchcock over here on the left. <laughs> Wow. See his mouth and, it, and his chin and his nose and his and uh, chin. eyebrow. Eye eyebrow. Uh, yeah, this is the eyebrow ridge. Yeah. Now, see, one of the things we don't understand about the veil is, first of all, it's a spherical, it's spherical material moving out from the source of the explosion, right? So we have some coming toward us, some going away from us, some going sideways to us. So I know, Leslie, it is beautiful. Uh, so if we look at this, we're looking at something that looks like this to us, okay? But if you saw it from another vantage point, it might look like this. From another world, another planet, elsewhere in the universe, it might have a broader face to it. We're seeing it from this particular side. We might be missing all the stuff that's on either side of that. So that could be going in and out of the page, basically. See that, Tina? That's why you come here for these things. Isn't that beautiful? It's in a very rich area of the Milky Way as well. That's beautiful. Look at that. Look at that thing. I mean, wow. Let's see if we can adjust our, our dark... Our, our what's called our black level let's bring that in a little bit just to get a little bit more contrast in here how do we got oh look at that and we've stacked four so far and I'm gonna go into a hundred percent and then move over just so you can see okay cuz we get in here you'll see just stars for now but I'm gonna move over and you'll actually see now the rest of this filamentary structure see that that's amazing <laughs> That's funny. Hey, Dagger. Welcome. Cindy Murphy, what's going on? Okay, we're going to just go out to 50% now so we can see more of it. Look at that. Now, the noise that we see when we zoom way in, that noise is averaged out as we stack so that's why it's the images are getting better and better and better the more we stack I said four before now it's up to five and so uh, let's give you an idea here this won't be too exciting I'm gonna go to 200% right now and you're gonna see uh, stars okay I can see that we might want to focus again here okay all right, but that said, you can see how this looks like there's noise. There's this modeling and stuff here. That's going to go away more and more and more as more of these are added together. That red thing on the right, is that a hot pixel? Yeah, it's actually, yeah, it is. That's an artifact right there. 
Okay, so now watch. Watch the noise here as it changes. Ready? Here it goes. Okay, it was very subtle. But it started to, some of that noise started going away. All right. Let's go back to 75%. Hi, Lauren Newbert. How are you? Laura, I'm uh, working on the, still working on the business arrangement uh, for Sky Tour. So um, I'd like to talk to you um, in just a few uh, few days here to a week. This is really pretty. That's striking. It, it is, and the colors look pretty good. You know? Mm. The colors look pretty good. Mmm. Almost like an X-ray on a side view. <laughs> yeah. Now moving over to the other side of the frame, we have the part of the central veil visible in this shot as well. There and up higher. Actually, mm. per I think what you said a few minutes ago, if we were to see it, uh, if we were to see the Eastern Veil face on, I would want it to look more like the Central Veil. You know, it'd actually be more diffuse and uh, yes, not as easy. it it would it would be because um, the Central Veil I think is more uh, more gossamer than the Eastern Veil. The Central Veil is this part. This is the Eastern Veil. We'll go to the Western Veil here shortly. But uh, this is 10 stacked images here. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll stop it here. I'll pause the stack. I know, as you've explained before with uh, like the actual shapes of uh, planetary nebulas. Uh, yes. Like the ring or the dumbbell, you know that uh, it's easier to see what's around the sides. Because that's where, you know, we're... Looking through more it. material. Yeah. And yep. when you're seeing it face on, you know, that's actually, there's going to be a much dimmer, less concentrated looking. That's so right. It's, it's like what we see in the center there is actually coming toward us more than what it is on the left side. Yeah, it's toward us or away from us. Yeah. Yeah, toward, toward us or away from us. Yeah. And actually... There are studies that could show us which direction that gas is moving. So we could, in fact, I think there are, so we'd figure that out. Hey, Amal, how are you? I know since I posted that link uh, the other night uh, showing expansion in the Crab Nebula over time, mm -hmm. YouTube's been offering me uh, time views of other deep sky objects. Uh, uh, well, it's, it's good at advertising. Right now, there's actually there's quite a few of them out there where, you know, yeah. you can Orion see Nebula. the change in the nebula over the course of time. Yep. Louis Tias is that bright object, the neutron star. Um, you might be talking about one of these stars here or whatever. Um, no, but there is a neutron star in the in this region that was the progenitor. Uh, a massive star that exploded that created the Veil Nebula. Uh, there are cases, by the way, when a star explodes where it it is uh, completely destroyed, where it doesn't leave anything behind. Those are more rare, but that has happened, I think, in uh, a couple cases. Um, and usually those are binary stars where that happens. But anyway, this is uh, really cool. And what I'd like to do now is take us over to the eastern or western veil because this is just beautiful. So what I'm going to do is go down to one second here. And you won't 
you won't see anything change yet because I have to get rid of the stack here. This again uh, is going to be up on the site. Okay. So here it is saved. Okay, I didn't see the save. There it is, now it's saved, and then save it exactly as seen. Okay. The more I hit that, if I, if I were to hit it again, I'd have yet another copy set made, so not a big deal. Okay, so now if I'll clear that, and come back over, and let me actually get rid of the live stack, because that's got to go for now. Okay. And now, what we can do is, with uh, a thousand milliseconds, or a second, we can now head over to the eastern, western veil, rather. And to do that, we don't even have to plug in any coordinates. All we have to do is tell the telescope to head west. As we do, you'll see the central veil come in. In more detail there it's coming in you can see it now so if I were to stop right now okay you'd see the central veil right here and then down here is the western veil okay which is broom which is broom so we're gonna actually look at that so I'm gonna bring this up Uh, for what we were saying a minute ago, folks, uh, when you saw that face in the eastern veil, imagine you're holding a basketball in your hands and you're looking at it right in front of you. Uh, that face is over on the left side of the basketball. Then the central veil is what would be right in front of you in the middle of the ball. And or in the back, And what we're about yeah. to see now with the witch's broom is the, on the right side of the bowling ball, of the uh, basketball. Yeah. Sort of on the edge. That's right. Know? If, if you consider that supernovae expand in a spherical manner, the interstellar medium has ways of not allowing that to happen. For instance, you saw the big gossamer extension of the eastern veil on that side, but then on this side, the western veil is really tightly packed. And that could be because over here on this side, the interstellar medium is actually denser with more material in it. Because it's full of stuff, it's not empty space. And so when that stuff runs up against it, Gossamer stuff gets crushed and, and compressed as it moves through and that could be responsible for these very tight filaments we see here. Uh, and that's that's part of the problem we have uh, is, is understanding how that all happens. Okay, we're going to do another 45 seconds here. All right, and then we'll go stack it and check out what we got. Oh boy, oh boy, I can't wait to see. Okay, we're going to clear this. I am always struck by how different the east side and the west side of the veil looks. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think part of that has to do with the structure of the interstellar medium in that in that region of the universe. Yeah. I mean, uh, as soon as the first image comes up, uh, I don't want to give it away before we see it. But, uh, yeah, you'll notice that down the bottom it looks more like the the eastern side, but at the top, it's it's more compressed and spindly. And there's also a bright star that you're going to see, probably with a halo, um, midway up that spindle. That star is a foreground star. It doesn't have anything to do with this nebula. So here we go. 52 Cerny. Yep. That's correct. You're right. Yeah, and so Western Veil always, it looks like an upside-down tornado almost, like a rope tornado. It does. You'll notice that this, this beautiful green... You know, what causes that green? Well, that's caused by uh, elements, chemical elements that are in the periodic table of the elements that were in that progenitor star, the original star that exploded, atmosphere. Um, and it, it, when stars are formed, they're formed with all kinds of elements already. The sun has elements in its atmosphere it can't possibly make in its, its nuclear furnace in the center because stars make elements in their cores. So the more massive stars made a lot of these different elements, and when they blew up and scattered them to the interstellar medium, 
Some of that was picked up in the solar nebula that then became the sun and the planets. That's why we have, say, uranium, uh, gold, and silver, and calcium, and thorium, and these other materials, you know, potassium, and sulfur, these different materials that are in our periodic table that were basically here when the sun formed, and thus the sun also has them in its makeup. The sun is, is right now, it's fusing hydrogen and making helium. Technically, it's an isotope of hydrogen making an isotope of helium. That's just a heavier versions of each, the little neutrons in the atom's cores. Uh, but that all said, what we're looking at when we look at the sun is a star that will make hydrogen into helium, helium into carbon maybe, but nothing really further beyond that. All the stuff that's in the sun's outer envelope okay, is very, very hot. And the electrons have been shot right off those those previous atoms, and now there's a lot of nuclei, or you know, atomic nuclei, out there in that envelope, and that's what's there. So we have calcium nuclei, we have magnesium nucleus, you know, nuclei. We don't have an atom of magnesium, an atom of calcium. They're they're nuclei, right? The electrons have, are gone. The electrons go into becoming, uh, you know, part of the solar wind, along with some of these things that that stream our way uh, in terms of the solar wind. Like when you see the sun go through a flare, it shoots off this massive material. What is that material? It's hot plasma. What is that? Well, plasma is what happens when you heat up atoms so hot that their electrons are forced off and you're left with very high energy protons and high energy electrons. That's plasma. And it will glow. And that's what's that's what heads toward us in a cosmic, uh, in a uh, coronal mass ejection. It's a cosmic blast from the sun, you know. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, Louis Ta, thank you actually, by the way, for putting your questions in caps. If if you have questions, folks, put them in caps like like Louis. He's doing the right thing. What causes the spindle form? We don't know that it's actually a spindle, Louis, because again, we're seeing it on edge like this. If we see it from the side, it could be like this. You know, um, but it can be compressed. But let's let's take a look at this section right here. If you take a look at this, it's spread out down here. It seems to be more relaxed, but this looks really tight up here, really tight right there, especially. If we look at this part of the interstellar medium, this area of space where this stuff is expanding into, it may all have looked like the veil on the other side. Okay, the eastern veil, which was more spread out. Okay, but. On this side, it's it's perhaps possible that there's dark matter, dark dark uh, dark uh, dust in here, uh, or other interstellar gas that this gas is colliding with, and when it collides with the gas that's here, what happens is, if it's all spread out, you know, it ends up getting compressed and ends up forming like a, a much a smaller cross-sectional shape, like you see there, okay. And what happens is also when it, it slows down rapidly by hitting other stuff in interstellar medium, it heats up. And if it heats up hot enough, then the atoms that make it up are going to uh, ionize, and then uh, it's going to ionize, and then they're going to uh, form uh, these these ions, which will then, uh, when the electrons come back into that atom, because that's what ionization is when the electrons leave. Now, when they come back in, they give off light. The oxygen atoms tend to give off this bluish green light. Hydrogen, hydrogen gives off this beautiful red light. Okay, we call it hydrogen alpha. There's also a hydrogen beta line, and there's other lines, that is to say, um, uh, uh, spectral responses that we see from these uh, supernova remnants. Okay, so it's it's pretty interesting. And these are emissions, by the way, so they'll show up. Uh, as a bright line in the spectrum, a line of oxygen. So that's actually pretty cool. Just like the Orion Nebula. The Orion Nebula is an emission nebula. And so those emit light, and we see that light as a bright line in the spectrum of the object. Mark, could you zoom in on the uh, upper portion of that, son? Up here? Yes. Yeah, sure. Let's or go to thing. what? Or the whole thing, 
top to bottom, bottom to top. Well, let's see. Let's see 75%. I mean, it's just, it sure looks like twisted filaments to me. Yeah. You know, it's like a dust devil or, a, as I said, a yeah. tornado. Yeah, we don't know, actually. I'd love to know. I mean, there could be some tortuous effects out there, uh, but it's also, uh, I also think that uh, when we look at something like this, we have to consider all the possibilities uh, and one of the possibilities is, as Daryl points out, maybe there's some twisting going on. But we would tend to see a corkscrew effect if if there was uh, on some of these filaments. And we don't really see a corkscrew effect like it's a, something that looks like it's going back and forth but could be doing this, you know. Uh, we don't that's really one see reason that. I wanted to zoom in on it is to see if uh, when we're backed out away from it, it does look almost twisted. But as mm -hmm. you move in, uh, I can see what you're saying. It doesn't look twisted so much. There are dis yeah. discrete filaments inside there. You can see some just to uh, below 52 city there. Yeah, and that's right farther. here. Yeah. 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 But the thing is, uh, you know, this this is this is again is one of the most beautiful uh, nebulae in the sky, and it's it's only available to. Um, those that have the telescope to see it otherwise you just don't get a chance to see it the other thing too i want to point out is that, is that the geometry of the universe is weird because sometimes you can you can see uh, some strange things oh kathleen see you later you have a good night um sometimes it's strange for instance if you look over here on the right You'd swear that you're looking at a vertical line of stars to a bright one to a horizontal line of stars. It's a perfect square, right? Because your mind, your brain is making perfect patterns. But in fact, this is not a perfect line. It's actually an arch. And it's actually below this star. And this line is also not a straight line. But your brain is making it look like a straight line. And that's called pareidolia. We try to get something. We try to make something understandable out of the non-understandable. So, uh, but sometimes there are real reasons why stars will be in chains like this. First of all, those could be at different distances from us and just have be a line of sight thing. When you have a lot of stars like we do here, the chances that are happening are very likely, you know, very likely. I think when you look at the, the whole witch's broom, mm -hmm. back out like that, so... It reminds me almost uh, like uh, spinning yarn, making wool, you know? Oh, yeah. Like it, it's uh, gathering the fibers at the bottom and spinning them tight into yarn toward the top. Sure. That's just an analogy, but it's sure what it looks like. Oh, it sure does. It looks good. Let's give ourselves the whole screen, shall we? Oh, that's really pretty. You know, you gotta, you gotta love this. You gotta love this. And it's dynamic. It's all moving. It is all moving, and that's the that's the thing uh, that many people can't really understand is that it's all moving. But you know, we always say, "Well, it's such a big universe that you can't see the movement, uh, except over tens of thousands of years." And it's like, how can anything be so large, you know? Then again, uh, you want to have your mind blown. Uh, the galaxy that's in Virgo called Measure 87, where there's a black hole that we found, that, that, <laughs> that galaxy is, what was it, 44 million light years away? Mm -hmm. And that was 44 million years ago when the light that, we see now from that galaxy left that galaxy and light speed is the fastest speed that things move in the universe so at that speed it still took 44 million years for that light to get here you gotta let that sink in and it's in that galaxy that we saw a black hole and if you are still having trouble with the light speed issue over time and distance then you're gonna have trouble with this one 
The black hole in the center of that galaxy is called a supermassive black hole, an SMBH. Okay, that supermassive black hole is so big that it dwarfs our solar system. I think it's something like six times bigger than our entire solar system. And if you think about it, it took us 15 years to get to Pluto with the New Horizons probe. 15 years. That's pretty far. So that means that black hole is huge. And yeah. that's what we mean by super supermassive black hole. What I think is cool about M87, yeah. uh, we can and actually the, see the we can see the jet being shot out from the black hole. That's from right. Forty five million light years away. Oh hi. Hold on. Yeah, how's it going? Yes, he but he, he can't join. I did, but he's not gonna be able to join. I yes, I told him that. I told him. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. I uh, apologize, Daryl. I missed that last part you said. I'm sorry. I, I missed that last part you said. I apologize. I had, uh, I had an interruption. I apologize. No, that's fine. I don't remember what I said. It doesn't matter. Are <laughs> you talking about the supermassive black hole? Oh, yeah. I just... Uh, it amazes me that we can actually see the jet being shot out by that black hole. Oh, that's right. And, and you know what? I can't wait to image that. I bet you we will be able to see it with this, too. I bet you will. Nice thing about this particular uh, telescope setup is that we can do our wide-angle views, and uh, it actually supports being able to zoom in quite a distance and see what we want, you know? So we can see far out like this, or we can zoom right in and still see some pretty good detail. I like that. This is good. Okay. Now I'm going to stop this with 18. All right. We'll save it. All right. So there's the green save bar. And we'll save it exactly as seen for those who want a beautiful picture. Which I will also process and make more, you know, better pictures as well. But now, uh, I think it's kind of interesting. We're going to go up some here in the same location. Okay. And we're going to go and make a... Let's do this. We're going to go make a run and look at not just the... Uh, I got the stack, though. No. We're going to... Hold on, let's see here. Okay, there is... That's what I want. Okay. We're going to run up now because I want to check out the central veil and get a beautiful picture of that. So, we're going to have all three. So, we're going to move to the east now a little bit. You're going to stitch them together eventually? I, I'd have to make a lot more than just these three. I'd have to make a, like nine different shots. Okay. And then stitch them together, yeah. But it, that's sort of a goal eventually. Well, I know, yeah, the whole veil, uh, east, middle, Big. and west, is over three degrees across. That's bigger than your field yeah. is, of course. Yeah. So there we go. Six, we move up now. Yeah. Hey, we got a satellite moving through while we're doing this. That's cool. Watching the live universe happen right before us. So now we go up here to this. We'll say, well, this will be good. So we'll have the Western Veil, the Central Veil dead center here. And let's go check this out. All right, so right now the telescope has a guide, a guide, uh, guide scope on it. And it's acquiring a star for us. So at the time, for the time being, we're going to uh, go again 45 seconds. And we're gonna kill, this is a hyper process state where you can actually see things in real time. But uh, we don't want to use that when we're getting our imagery, except in rare cases. So, so I'm going to cut that off. It's sort of like a finder, uh, but very high end. And then we're going to just zoom in here uh, once this cuts coming in. And uh, we've got 45 seconds to check out the central veil. 
so now we saw both sides one's really tightly wound the other one is sort of gossamer but like this now we're going to see one that's either behind or you know or in front of this nebula so it's either coming toward us or going away from us we can't really tell uh, maybe going up to all right and we'll see it in just a moment I might be able to just do this. Let's see. Ready? Here we go. Ready? Three seconds. Two, one, zero. Bam. Ah, look at that. Look at that. So you can see that in this direction, if you imagine what that looks like from the edge, it looks like this to us, but from the edge, it might look like that. You know, it might look like the, the Eastern Veil, the thing that's just over there, you know. It might be going up, too. Look at that. Mm. Again, oxygen is showing up as this greenish-blue. Uh, hey, c &D boy. And hey, Genghis, how are you? I don't think I, didn't think I said hi to you, Genghis. What would you say, Daryl? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I was muted. I was say, trying to say that uh, that's the best I've seen of the uh, central portion of the veil. Yeah, and the red is hydrogen alpha, and possibly some neon. Um, <clears throat> that portion has its own sort of look to it. Yes, it does. From the west. Yeah, it kind of looks like somebody standing with, uh, you know, holding a staff. You know, head, body, arm, <laughs> and spinning a rope tornado. <laughs> <clears throat> kind of cool. Yeah. So you see, guys, you come here and you see all these really cool things, you know. I'm going to zoom in to see if the temperature is what it's doing to our focus. I'm going to go to 150% right now. Um, looks like we could do with a little change in focus, but we'll stick this out. We'll stick this out. That looks really cool all by itself. It does, doesn't it? Let's go to 75% uh, on that. Look at that. This beauty belies the absolute chaotic cataclysmic explosion that it caused it because this stuff is all intertwined and expanding uh we don't you know know the direction per se some of it could be going out like this some could be going straight up some could be going back and forward um so it'd be great to be able to see this over the course of say a hundred thousand years to watch what it does. We watch the Crab Nebula over a hundred years and we actually see it expanding. It's just beautiful. Yeah, this is just stunning. Look at it just splays out like this. And the shape is, is very related, very much related problem, perhaps, to um, the interstellar medium and what's in it. Yeah. I find it interesting when you look at the Western Veil, the Witch's Broom, mm -hmm. it looks mostly uh, O3. And you look at mm -hmm. this and it's got, you know, it look the, the two different colors, the two different elements are distinct, yet they're yes. sort of blended, you know, or mixed together, or running in close proximity yeah. to each other. That's right. That's right. So let's do this. Let's drop this back out. Let's go to 40%. Hey, Zadarak, how you doing? But if you look at the if you look at the Western Veil, you'll see there are some red. There is red filamentary structure in here. It's just that it's dominated by the O3. This this oxygen emission that we're seeing here. Yes. This is really pretty. And the nice thing is that there's so much of it. Look at that up there. Look at this down here. 
Very, very cool. Oil and water. Yeah, Genghis. I see. I get your point. Yeah, Laura Newbridge says, Rorschach test of the universe. Exactly right. What do you see in this shape? Um, I see a guy, a warrior with a beard and a helmet, red helmet. And his, he's green, standing here with a staff. And this is his arm. And he's twirling a whip or a rope tornado. And he's got his legs down here. And he's just sort of standing there. You know. I mean, it could be that too, right? Kind of reminds me of a tree. Well, because of that spindly nature, yeah. Wow. Now, this is the best I've seen of this portion of the nebula. Yeah. I do think that I want to want to kick down the green a little bit here. So we have a black background, and then we see the true colors here. Leslie, I'm so happy that you're enjoying this. I'm happy that you guys are here and enjoying this. This is really cool. Again, this is a supernova remnant. This is the remnant of a star that, is, that used to be just a regular star. One of these little tiny points that you see here. But look at the disastrous damage it can do to the universe. Look at all the stuff that it has spewed. This is what happens when a star blows up. You know, a star that might have gone unnoticed. And then boom. But it was massive. And it was probably a star that was um, um, an O or a B star. Which means it was hot and blue. I'm just stunned by this. Isn't it beautiful? I'm trying to visualize how the whole nebula would, uh, you know, fit into uh, whatever shape it is, truly is. Yeah, for sure. I mean, is, is this part, you know, on the side of the basketball facing us or the side away from us or... The uh, side on which, top. Which the side on top, too. Yeah, we don't know the perspective, you know. And we don't even know that it's shaped like a basketball. It could be shaped like a kidney, you know, depending on, on what's in the medium that's slowing down the shock wave on one side versus the other. Exactly. Uh, we see that a lot with, with uh, wolf rayette stars, which are very hot young stars that are, that are spewing off their outer envelopes and will eventually lead to supernovas. Um, that's something that... Uh, is a good question, you know. Um, oh, Lauren, then we're going to ask a question. Does our asteroid belt protect us in any way? Um, you know what, Laura? I think that our asteroid belt, it, it doesn't protect us as much as Jupiter protects us. Um, Jupiter being out there actually provides a lot of gravitational tugging on things that might make their way into the inner solar system. So it's probably part of the reason we're still here. But the asteroid belt, um, you know, here, here's a common thing, a common thing to think about. How much material is actually in the asteroid belt? Uh, and if you put it all together, would it make a planet the size of the Earth? Well, what, what size would it be? The answer is rather astonishing. The answer is that if you put everything in the asteroid belt together for the millions of asteroids that are there, it would make up something that's the mass of only one quarter of the moon so that's not a whole lot of stuff yet there's lots of them and and Ceres and uh, Vesta and some of these other asteroids are the biggest ones that are there but they actually they're part of this family of asteroids that are in the asteroid belt but together they only add up to like a fourth of the moon and Cypher says Jupiter's a big brother, and it really is, in a sense, because 
it, you know, and this is good music for Jupiter. It sounds like Jovian music. Okay, Jupiter is a very, very large gravitational tugger, and it will pull. Um, it'll pull the. Um, it'll pull the asteroids and other things that are making their way uh, out of the asteroid belt and help realign them. Because what's it doing? Jupiter is out beyond the asteroid belt. And as it goes around the asteroid belt, it's pulling on everything in the asteroid belt and pulling it toward it a little bit. And then as it goes by, they go back. And they're, they're actually moving faster. So if objects are moving, here's Jupiter moving this way, and here's the asteroid belt moving this way. As Jupiter is going by, okay, the asteroids are going this way. They're kind of bowing out a little bit and then going back in as they go around the sun. They go make a little bit of a bow. And that kind of helps regulate their motions. You know, um, but, you know, because Jupiter is so big, uh, it doesn't cause anything that could potentially destroy us. And that's something that uh, that we're very grateful for. Jupiter is there as our as our basically as our savior, you know. So. Oh, yeah. OK, this is 15 stacked. We're going to stop here now. And we'll say goodbye to the Veil Nebula for now. Okay. All right, it's saved. Out there for all to have and see. Saved exactly this way. This will be up there in just a few minutes. And now we'll clear this and move to another location. Something that I think is worth looking at. And I think Daryl might know where I'm going. Because we looked at a supernova. And if we're going to look at something different now, we're going to be looking at a different type of end state for a star. <coughs> a, dumbbell? A, more uh, a more quiescent type, yeah. And that would be the Dumbbell Nebula. Yeah, so... And then maybe after that we could go check out. Now let's see, the dumbbell should be right here. And that's 30 degrees. That's actually. We're going to end up at Alberio. All right, well, let's try it. Okay. We told the telescope to head more west. Uh, we have a better view looking to the west than looking to the east. Okay. And this star right here is probably Alberio. It's the star that forms the head of Cygnus the Swan. And then from there, we're going to go down to... Uh, let me see if I can... If we can actually... Um, see the colors yeah see you see orange and you see blue it's a double star that's orange and blue okay and then once we get in here there's the dumbbell and I'm gonna zoom in and see if our focus is good here Yes, Isabella, planetary nebulae will all eventually go away. Indeed. All right. Okay, I can see that we need a little extra focus here. Yeah. We'll just catch up uh, now. What's that? Uh, the focus is catching up. Temperature must be going down. Yeah, it is. Let's try, let's try 418, see if that works. Yeah, that's better. Yeah, I think 418, now see we're at, the, we're at the point where 418 is the better focus now. We started at 48,550 and we went down to 418. There we go. And you can even see the central white dwarf in the middle of the dumbbell nebula okay 
But let's do this. Let's go and do a... I won't do too much because it, it'll get it'll get overblown. Let's just do a 12 second exposure here and stack it. We may have to clear. No, we don't. Good. All right. So now watch this. This is going to be a real pretty sight as well. Ready? Here we go. Wow. Let's fix that. This will, right here, this is going to fix it. Here we go. Yeah, we're going to do this. All right, and bring it down. This is one since collimation. Uh, uh, it shows us more than I've seen before. Like the, here. Uh, uh, there, but all the way around the thing, like over toward 9 mm -hmm. o'clock and 3 o'clock or 9.30 and 2.30. Yeah. Uh, you see those delineated green edges to yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, like shells. And uh, yeah. the red parts, uh, whether they're hydrogen or neon or whatever, they're so discreet from the green. They are. separate. They, they, it's like they happen at different times or different parts of the star mm -hmm. when it cut yep. loose. Yep. So this is a. Uh, this is now. This is also a, a star remnant, and uh, but it it's a star death that's different from a supernova. This is where the star has used up its nuclear fuels. And so, uh, and see, Daryl, there's going to be more here, so watch. Mm. See, if you look, you'll see there's there's additional stuff outside even that. Yes. See that? So, this is, uh, the Dumbbell Nebula here is really interesting because when the star uses up its, its, uh, its uh, hydrogen, it starts to uh, fuse helium when it can, and helium becomes carbon. And... If the star can't get much further than that, like our sun, then it starts to pulsate because it, is, it starts to fuse helium. And as it's fusing helium, the star begins to bloat and go really big. Um, the helium starts in a shell outside the core. And then it finally it comes back down and pulsates. And as it's pulsating, it's puffing off these shells of material. You can see these shells right here. See? These shells are being puffed off. They were being puffed off. And... That puffing off is the atmosphere, the outer, the outer envelope of the star being released and let go. And when it's done, the inner star, what's left in the core, begins to compress and, and contract down to a white dwarf. White dwarfs are hot and they're blue. As you can see, these stars look kind of blue. That star looks, I'm sorry, that's, these stars are kind of white and this star looks markedly blue. And that's because... It's a white dwarf that's very hot. It has ionizing radiation that's causing the atoms of oxygen to glow green. It's blue. Okay. And the atoms of neon and hydrogen to glow red that you see here. So it's really a very fascinating location. I think uh, it would be best if we drop it down in intensity a little bit. Actually, it might be easier to see what's going on. Uh, that red object at four o'clock, the red area, uh, yeah. that is just so intense, and it looks almost like a ray pointing back toward the white dwarf, like that was a yeah. discrete event all by itself, like something came shooting out of the star. Yeah, I mean it could very well be, it could very well be. And the other thing too is, uh, when you notice this, this the way this looks, okay. Uh, the star is here, and you, you have a marked, like, lots of material here, lots of material here, much less over here. So what's going on? Well, if the original star was spinning like this, okay, then as it's spinning like this, now what I'm saying spinning, spinning on its axis in this direction, okay, then when stuff was shot off, it might be more, uh, shot, it might be shot off more in the equatorial directions, which is why there's more this way and that way possibly 
and less in the north and south direction. This is a specific type of planetary, these are called planetary nebulas, but it's a specific type of planetary called a bipolar nebula. Okay, bipolar. Now to show you just how much we're zoomed in here, we're gonna zoom out. This is the native resolution. This is the, the, the resolution that we should be able to use. But if I zoom out, to show you the, the, the fitting it in the entire field of view, that's how big it is. Okay, so you see what's going on here. So we go to 100% and this is where we are right here. Okay, and the Dumbbell Nebula, you can see all the details in there. Could you go a little more, zoom a little in? further? In? Sure. Here. Lots of detail in there. Look at this, yeah. And the red thing at 4 o'clock, that still looks like uh, a jet pointing back toward the star. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. I'm, I'm hoping that this was, uh, it's just sort of a nice classroom. It's sort of a dynamic live classroom with music. <laughs> you know? Yeah, definitely. And there's some here, too. It, it, there's definitely some regularity to it, as well as some chaos. It's just beautiful. Mark, would you excuse me for a moment, please? Sure. Right so this is about okay. This is about two light years in diameter, right? Um, and now what we'll do is we're going to go to a another one. Uh, let's go back here, and we'll save this stack as well. Pause it and save it. It doesn't matter if I'm zoomed in or not. It, it's saving the whole frame. Okay, so that's good. And then we will save exactly a scene. There we go. Daryl will come back. We're all gone. The stream's over, you know. <laughs> I'm kidding. All right. And then we'll just take this here. Go back to one second for our startup again. You guys might notice this music is different. It's all new. All right. And let's bring this back up here. Mm -hmm. Okay. There it is. This is our live view. So it's kind of cool how huh, to be able to actually have such a live view like this. We can just move around. I like it. Okay. That said, let's go check out another object that is in the neighborhood. Oh, that might be problematic. All right, we're going to find out. I'm going to try and get us to another area that might be Another object that might have a problem. We'll find out. All right. We'll do it this way. Okay, so we're going to go here. We're going to look at another object. All right. And thing we're gonna do is, I know we're at 20 degrees, but we might be able to observe this. So what we're gonna do is go north a little bit. Okay. And then we're gonna go west. see if the observatory wall gets in the way here again once we have the lifting piers this will be a non-problem it's for this type of object in fact that it's it's made for this so should we see it here we should see it 
and we do. There it is right there. Okay, so we're going to drop ourselves down. Even one second is too long an exposure in this setting. Um, okay, let's let's move the telescope over this way. Okay. And then go north a little bit. Okay. Welcome back. Thank you. You know, I was thinking while I was away, uh, it may be too late in the evening now, but uh, what the dumbbell made me think of? What's that? The helix, of course. Oh, yeah. I was thinking of the uh, ring. Okay, that too. And I got the ring here now. That's a good pick. It's only 20 degrees above the horizon, so it, but it's perfect for thinking. I mean, look how tiny it is. Yeah. You know? So what we want to do right away is to go in, say, 50%, actually 66% on this. <clears throat> you know? And as you can see, it's already uh, really too... Uh, it's, it's just not it's just too bright I almost have to take this off take off our settings here and we're just gonna do let's do a, a 12 second shot here it'll be way too bright but I want to show you something all right and we'll do a stack on this too It's gonna look like. Now. I think so, but we'll check it out. Okay, that's beautiful. And we can see the star in the middle of this too, typically. Let me, uh, let me do an adjustment here. There it is. See, it was just being overwhelmed. Yeah, he looks in the southwest. You might still be able to catch it, though, if you like. All right, well, we'll check it out. Show people three uh, showcase nebula, uh, planetary nebulas. Yeah. Takes time. Yeah. All right, let's just Rings do this. Rings one of let's my go. favorites. Oh, it's beautiful. I always love looking at it in the uh, eyepiece. Always looks like uh, looks like somebody blew a big sm smoking cigar, or blew in a smoke ring out in space. Yeah. You don't see the colors like you do uh, with the camera. It just looks like a, a gray smoke ring, very discreet looking, floating yeah. in the sky. Plus, uh, the ring is so easy to find. Yeah. Well, that's the Saturn Nebula. Oh. Uh, where's the helix from here? It's, uh... Well, let's see. I have Stellarium open. Uh, a little different than you. Uh, it is uh, due east of Sat of Jupiter. Okay, well it's then you sort might of have between a Aquarius. And, uh, sort of between uh, uh, Aquarius and Pisces Austrinus there. I got it. Okay. Oh, it's uh, about 28 degrees above the horizon. Or 27? Let's find out. What does it say? 27 degrees, yeah. <clears throat> okay. All right. Well, that's where we'll go next. But first, let's go back to the ring. Yeah, there's our ring. 
And the ring has this thing because it, the ring has this thing. The ring is so uh, bright that it's really hard to take pictures of it without blowing out different pieces of it. You know? So that looks pretty cool. Boom. <laughs> So, hey, it's worth checking out. Okay, so this is 17 exposures. Of course it is. What is this? Showcase objects. That's right. All right, let's save. Now we'll do this. And everything we're looking at is the quiescent way that stars die so far. The supernovas are the violent explosions among the largest the universe can provide. Now we're looking at the quiescent deaths of stars. We saw the dumbbell, we see the ring. Now we'll see another one that is the closest planetary nebula to us. And uh, that is going to be the one that I think people will enjoy as well. And with the collimated telescope, I haven't seen this one yet, so it'll be beautiful. Yes. Can't wait to see it. Yeah. All right. So let's do this. Do one second. And get our finder mode, our hyper finder mode, and drop out to fill the frame. Okay. And now let's go and see where we are. 25 degrees. Well, let's try it. Here we go. All right. This is another Tels object sort of going away for the season. Mm-hmm. Telescope's going to whip around. Let's see which way it goes. It's going to look for a star before it heads down. Okay, looks like we're going to use this star right here. Which star is it? Fomalhaut, maybe? Uh, no, it's too high for Fomalhaut. Scat! Okay. <laughs> scat, boy, scat! Meow! 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 Yeah. Alright, so it's auto-centering scat, and then it's going to jump from there down to the Helix Nebula. Then it's going to find a guide star, and then we can take pictures. So, here we go. There's the helix. You can already see it's a much bigger planetary nebula than any we've seen so far. Yeah. It's the closest one to us. And it's really something else. It's really pretty. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to... Drop us a little south here, a little more. Marianne is here. Hey, Marianne. Now, folks, this okay. will rock your socks off. Now this will, is, I think, because... Yeah. yeah. I'm going to do... This is uh, like seeing the ring, but much closer. As if we're right near it, yeah. Okay, we're going to do a 45-second shot here and yeah, we're gonna let it find a guide star here comes the meet a, a satellite right through look at that here we go zoom 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 zoom, zoom. okay and you might notice it stopped that's because we're in the middle of a 45 second exposure now so we're gonna go live stack this okay and this is going to be another one that's beautiful. So we're going to be ready for it. Here it comes. I'm so excited. So excited. Ten seconds away. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. And mm. okay, it's just the beginning. Now, this one will really build up with uh, 
stacking. Yeah. And I can't wait to zoom in on this one. Yeah, this will be pretty. Let's do that. Let's actually... Let's, first of all, let's try and... Let's try and bring out some more detail. Ha! <laughs> now let's get rid of the green if we can. There we go. Now that's looking really nice. All right, let's let's do this. Let's maximize that. Go full screen. Ah, look at that. Closest one to us. Look at that white dwarf right there. And um, we're gonna go to. Uh, we'll do seventy-five percent right now. Wow. Like an eye. Yeah. Sauron. The eye of Sauron. Okay, and uh, I'd like to actually. I'm going to change the black level a little bit. The black level will set how dark the background looks, and it will help add contrast to. Those faint red arcs that are visible in this nebula. Okay, we'll as go Mark there for said, now. As Mark said, this is the closest planetary nebula to Earth. Uh, it's uh, it's in the southern sky, though. Uh, um, it's so close to us, actually, it's hard to see with the eye in a telescope. I have only seen yeah, it, it is. once. Through the telescope, and that was using a hydrogen beta filter, if I remember correctly. Otherwise, it's so dim. Sometimes people ask, you know, golly, can we see those colors out in space? And uh, distance helps, you know, because it helps kind of concentrate it all together into a smaller package that looks brighter for our eyes to see. When it's so close, it looks so dim that you can't even see it without uh, filtration. Yeah. Uh. And the reason, of course, is because the nebula is so s distended that you're not getting a lot of color per uh, square area uh, that's going into your eye. Um, and it's, it's spread out. I mean, look at the details we can see here. This is really pretty. All this, this modeling you see is going to go away. Because as we uh, we've we've got five stacked. If we go to like fifteen stacked, a lot of this noise goes away. And our temperature is uh, right now is minus ten on the uh, uh, minus ten Celsius. Daisy and Zoe Amethyst says looks like a circular rainbow. Yeah, it kind of does. Very nice. Yes, it is. Isabella did a good uh, example of this a while back. This really turns out yeah. tonight, so it's collimation that she might have to do it over again. <laughs> hint, hint. Oh, she, I'm afraid she's going to have to. If any of you out there are into Photoshop or whatever, you can, you can take all these and bring the fits file into Photoshop there's a, a plugin that allows you to do that and it's not that expensive I think it's like 15 or 20 dollars and then you can actually bring the uh, fits file directly into Photoshop and operate on it but you can also view the fits file in other uh, online packages look at this thing look at this you know here look hey check this out <laughs> uh. That's really pretty. Again, as with the uh, Dumbbell Nebula, note the color of this star in the center here. These are all predominantly kind of a whitish star, but that's a very, very distinctly blue star. That's a white dwarf. Um, 
White dwarfs are strange because they're extremely compressed. And if they were more massive, they could be compressed even more into a neutron star, which is the next step. And if more massive still, then they could com they could compress themselves into black holes. But the reason that the white dwarf is, is like it is is because it shrinks down. It has a certain amount of mass. That amount of mass is less than 1.44 solar masses. Okay, that's a that's called the Chandrasekhar limit. It's actually a, a value that we discovered. I say we collectively. Um, it's a value that was discovered because of the fact that uh, it was the maximum mass that a white dwarf could have. Beyond that, it would become a neutron star. So finding that natural dividing line had to have a name, and it was the Chandrasekhar. Subrahamyam uh, Chandrasekhar had discovered this. Um, and so this, this particular star is holding together by something called electron degeneracy. The surface is kind of a shell, kind of like a billiard ball. All right, and it's extremely hot, has some pretty heavy duty magnetic fields generally, uh, and it will cause a lot of ionization because it's spewing out most of its radiation in the ultraviolet. And that ultraviolet energy is what causes things like uh, ionization to occur. And what's ionization again? It's when the electrons going around an atom are uh, given uh, are, are gaining energy from the ultraviolet energy and they actually go higher and higher and higher and higher until they go right out um, you know uh, right off the atom Didi Sagittarius Tara says hi Marianne Mark and Daryl is Didi Sagittarius uh, Tara oh maybe it is That's interesting. What I find remarkable, remarkable about that white dwarf there. Uh, yep. How close is the helix? 150 light years away, or something like that. Yeah, and the white dwarf's like the size of the Earth. Uh, oh yeah, and we can still see it. Yeah. That's, that's the mass of a star packed down into something as small or smaller than our planet and we can see it that far away mm -hmm. yeah that's how hot it is that's how hot it is that's how much energy it has well again it's this nuclear fusion furnace that has been reduced in size by compression to the size of the earth and it's gotten so compressed it can't compress any further because of this thing called electron degeneracy which I haven't even defined um, imagine a checkerboard. Imagine all the squares of a checkerboard. Imagine that uh, electrons can only occupy one per square of a checkerboard. When the checkerboard is full, it can't be crushed anymore. Imagine stretching that out to a whole star. Okay, This means that the electrons are actually pushing back with a force of their own. And so what we're talking about is little more than what we call electron degeneracy it's actually electron degeneracy pressure and that's what's keeping the star uh, intact right because the compression wants to crush the star but the electrons are not letting it and that reaches that balance point okay that 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 wonderful uh, equilibrium point where the electrons are pushing out because the uh, every checkerboard square is full of electrons and it can't crush any further you can crush further if mass gets added to the star. And if mass gets added to the star, a couple things can happen. You can actually end up with uh, a catastrophic explosion of the star. Or you could actually end up getting a further collapse, which sends it into a neutron star state. And what's a neutron star? Well, a neutron star is uh, a star that has neutron degeneracy pressure. And that's what holds it up. So electron degeneracy, neutron degeneracy, okay? And beyond that, it's black hole territory. And then all bets are off. You know? Yeah, the uh, electron degeneracy pressure, uh, 
no analogy is perfect, but you might imagine it like trying to uh, push two repelling magnets together and trying to overcome that uh, mutual repulsion between the two. Yeah, and that's that's kind of like the electron in each square of a checkerboard, you know, with with you know trillions yeah. of checkerboards across the whole star. You know, you can only have one electron per square. You can't put two in there because of that repulsion type of thing. Because remember, uh, they're all negatively charged, so uh, they're going to repel each other. They're not going to be uh, they're not going to be attracted to each other. Yeah, when you get to the neutron star state, well all the additional mass that you're compressing everything together with is enough to overcome that electron pressure and you're actually forcing the electrons down onto the protons and the electrons and the protons combine and make neutrons mm -hmm. and that's a lot of there's force. a there's a lot of force there's a lot more to it than that but yeah that's true Yes, there is. I'm yeah. just trying to keep some. Yeah, no, that's fair. That's good. So, Dee Dee, Sagittarius, um, you're with Terra, is my guess, correct? And you're flying into Reno? I'll find out in a second, won't we? If they can hear this. I don't know if they're hearing us. They might not be able to hear us. That's okay. So yeah, we've got uh, 16 stacks so far, and look at the noise is, is, is going down now. We're losing it, and we're getting gorgeous detail in here. And look at this arc is now deforming nicely. We're looking at this. It looks really nice. Hey, DK. How you doing? Wow, it's looking pretty. I mean, look at this. This is gorgeous, isn't it? I mean, look at that. Wow. Ugh. Can you start zooming in more on it now? Maybe at about the 12 o'clock point out in the ring around it? See the yeah. details loud. Yeah, let's do that. Oops, sorry. Let me move over a little. If you go from the uh, white dwarf in the center there, uh, and you look oh down at about eight o'clock. Uh, we're starting to see details in the cloud in that inner wisp. Yeah, there, right there. Up at about 11 o'clock or 11.30. Yeah, and up there. There's some really nice-looking striations up here. Yeah, this is really pretty. I'm going to actually try something else, too. I'm going to reduce the enhancement a little bit because I think that might be crippling us a bit. From 1.5, I'm going to drop it down to, like, uh, just 1. Maybe even less. Actually, let me try turning it off. And, and now it'll be a little softer. That's interesting, though. Okay, I'm gonna put it back on. Thanks, DK. Always good to see you here. Thanks for coming by. So, Marianne, you said your baby is home. What's your baby? Did she tell you guys yet? I think I know. Is it a dog? Nope. Cat? Marianne strikes me as more of a dog person. Oh, she has a dog. She has a boxer. A oh. boxer mix. Named Snickers. I think the dog hates its name. I mean, who would be wanting to be called Snickers? I've never seen that dog laugh. But you know what? The dog is... Whoa, what happened? Oh. I see, I see what I did. I popped out of the live stack, but it's still there. I accidentally closed the live stack, but it's still there. And still stacking. Nah, it's not a motorcycle. Oh, should have known. She told us that last night. <laughs> 
Yeah. I was just letting other people make uh, see what they were gonna do, see what they say. Okay. Yeah. This uh, this stack looks nice now. Uh, let me get out of here. Let me zoom back out. This is as far as I'm going to go for the uh, zooming out. And I'm going to do is, because I want to point out something else that's happening here in this image. Because there's more stuff that is visible. And yeah, we got to use the dark level a little more. That's too much. Actually, let me, uh, let me do this. This might be a little too bright. But it points out something really interesting. If you look here, okay, you see that there's more stuff out here. Yes. And more stuff out here. Yeah, that stuff's there, that's obvious, but this is also there. Okay, so let's bring the black level down now, again. Uh, when you see that outer part at upper left, and yeah. in the inner part, it has almost kind of a corkscrew shape, like a pretty evident the star was spinning when it was uh, this here? losing matter. Uh, oh, all that. Uh, when you go to the inner part at about 12 o'clock, you can see the beginning of a corkscrew right there. And it, it yeah. spirals all the way around. Well, one, one thing to keep in mind is that, again, the interstellar medium here uh, can have a variety of densities to cause this to happen. This here was ejected first. Yeah. Uh, and then this stuff here was ejected first. Okay. So we're seeing stuff that was ejected at a time when um, the star had yet to eject this most likely. Yes. And that was probably the first stuff to come out. Sort of like you know? looking down on a rotary water sprinkler, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, move this over a little bit more. And then just work it back slowly. <coughs> now, <coughs> take this one. Work it down. <coughs> okay. Now check it out. We should have less noise now. Isn't this great? You can actually see more of radial radial details in here now. So, ah, uh, it looks wow. very dynamic. Yeah, it's a. This is by far the best image of the helix I've ever taken in my life. This very one right here. This is this is the quintessential image. Look, you got a tier here of stuff. You have a tier here of stuff. You know, that's really really exciting. You know. Oh yeah. All right, we got 19 stacked. I'm gonna resume here. Look at that. This is another that I know you've talked about. You know the real shape of various planetary nebulas before. Uh, that this may be like a barrel shape that we're seeing sort of end on. Yeah, I, I. <clears throat> yeah, but you know if you think about it. <clears throat> what are the chances that we're going to be able to look you straight in in end on to a barrel? I think there's more to it than that. I think that I think that as I've said before, this is a spherical predominantly a spherical outburst on all sides. And if you look at my fingers, you can't see through my fingers on the edge, but you can see through them on the ends. Okay? And I think that's why it looks thicker on the edges because we're seeing through more stuff. And I think of that's course. what we're seeing here. Yeah. I think that's what we're seeing. Hey, Louis Rodriguez, how are you? Louis has uh, <clears throat> properly called out the the uh, dead pixel star up here. Well done. Well, well, good eye, good eye. <laughs> yep. Look at that. That's just something. <clears throat> wow. Yeah, the blue stripe, the blue object right there. I think you're talking about Lewis. Over left at the edge of the nebula. Oh, that's the green. Yeah, see, that's the green dead pixel star. 
<laughs> that's actually not a, 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 a dead pixel. That's actually an artifact. Um, and as the as the telescope is correcting, we're getting these things to walk a little bit over time. You'll notice that the blue one looks identical over here. It's doing the same exact path, same exact thing. Uh, you'll see red ones too. I mean, but I am just loving this, Daryl. This is beautiful. Look at the detail. We can start to see now some of these <clears throat> details in here that you really see with only the bigger telescopes. These yeah. are radial spokes. <clears throat> you know, these radial spokes. And I just can't get enough of this. My God. Uh, those spokes uh, uh, in uh, observatory, uh, professional observatory images, uh, I think they call them cometary globules or something like that. They're not really uh, comets. Yeah. But, uh, they sort no, of they're like just... Comets. Yeah. You can yeah. see them uh, sort of like a fringe all the way around the inside of it. Yes, sir. Yeah, the details are really coming out now. Yeah, they are. Let's try and zoom in more. <clears throat> We're going to zoom into the limit. Yeah, see, this this color modeling is going to go away. Because we can, we correct for that. Um. This is a dim planetary nebula, too, because it's so distended and big that you don't really get to see too much of it. But now, ooh, now that our telescope is doing so much better, um, we're going to be able to see probably the full extent of this. You can see the reddish stuff out here and, the, of course, the red there. Can you wow. push in again on that a little bit? Zoom in a little farther. Yeah. I know you can see earlier uh, that uh, inner layer uh, at about uh, 8 o'clock to the central star. Even a little right more. There? Yes. Uh, there and on the inside edge of that. Uh, yeah. You just start to see uh, uh, the finer details of... Uh, Mm -hmm. The sort of spiky stuff on the inside of that. Yep. And see, we know what this looks like, guys. So we, we know what to expect. But uh, we've never seen it with this telescope. You know? I think I could refine the focus a little bit, too, now that we've done all this. But um, I think that... Uh, I think this is good. You know? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to... Right at 6 o'clock. See what? Oh, one uh, of these? That right there, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw that. Okay. We're going to save this. Okay. And we're going to save it exactly as seen. Okay. And then we're going to clear it. Now you're going to say, what are you doing that for? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to get out of this, go down to one second, <coughs> and sure. are you not done yet? Thanks, DK. Well, I'm Thank not you, done DK. yet. Thank you, DK. That's so kind. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to check out the focus. And see if indeed 418, we dropped it down. Let's see if we can get it even better. 416. I noticed the stars were looking a little elongated uh, yeah. when you zoom in. Uh, might that be yeah. focus or might you have some wind tonight? A little bit of wind, perhaps, but it's also possible that. The guiding was slightly off. I'm not sure. Okay. I'm gonna take uh, us right out of the, take us right out of focus here. Okay, so now we're out of focus, and then I'm going to bring us back into focus. Okay.
Okay. I mean, it is relatively low to the horizon, so focus is going to be kind of tough. Yeah. Well, it's another one that's westering, it's dropping, and it was already yeah. low to the horizon and uh, past its prime for the season, I suppose. Well, nice to I see it. I agree with that. Time, yeah, and we saw it better than if we've ever seen it. Okay. Yeah, actually, I think that we we're as focused as we could get there. Hey, thanks, Science Bob. Thanks for checking it out with us. Okay. So, um, let's go back to auto here. <clears throat> Boy, where's the time go? We're in here two hours, 16 minutes already. Okay. Well, that was good. So, if you look, uh, well, let's pop out of here so we can see where the telescope is. You'll notice the, the coloration here. Uh, we're actually probably impinging on the wall a little bit, which is why we're getting this little bit of coloration. Again, once I have the lifting columns, we'll be like 20 inches higher, and it won't, we won't have any problem. Um, okay. So we saw a supernova. We saw... Three planetary nebulae, the Dumbbell, the Ring Nebula, and now the Helix. Uh, we have literally looked at all the ways that stars die tonight. Well, we haven't seen a Nova, but... I haven't looked What's at that? a neutron star yet. No, we haven't. We could later. I'd have to find... Uh, well... We gotta wait a little while um, if the crab comes up in time. Yeah, we're thinking the same thing. Yeah. All right, so let's zoom out of this and let's go. Let's check out. Uh, maybe should I just look at Andromeda because it's just so beautiful? Yeah. All right, folks, we're going to check out the Andromeda Galaxy, too. There's so many other things. And once we're up in that region of the sky, we'll be back. We have all these other places to go. Okay, let's... Um... Okay, if you look at the telescopes going, it's looking straight up. Thank you, Leslie. Leslie Latin Taylor, my gosh, thank you so much. That is just so beautiful. Thank you very much. Daryl, I want to identify this little object right here. Next to this star. So let's go find out what star this is. Okay. Right. It is that star. Again, thank you, Leslie. That's just beautiful. Is that Mirage? Yeah, it's Mirage. Yeah. And there's got to be something near Mirage that we're looking at. Oh, it's a galaxy. Uh -huh. it's, a, it's a little galaxy next to Mirage. Look at that, right there. Yeah. Wow. So where do you folks, where are you folks from, most of you? So tell me where you guys are, are, are watching from. Wow. I'd love to know. Okay, the Andromeda Galaxy, if you look at the telescope in the building there, okay, the Andromeda Galaxy is almost directly overhead. So this is going to be probably one of the finest images that we could ever get of the Andromeda Galaxy from here. Here we go. Wow. Okay. Even with our finder mode, look at how beautiful the Andromeda Galaxy looks. I mean, this looks like a typical picture that's Leslie's in Fort Worth, Texas. Okay. Lewis Poway. Science Bob's in Auburn, Alabama. That's cool. Cypher 2's in Minnesota. 
Donald Kunzer, welcome. I haven't talked to you yet today. Good, good. Thank you for coming. He's in South Jersey. That's kind of where Marianne Robb is from. She lives in Arizona now, but she is from Jersey. I didn't know that. Yeah, CND Boy is from Vancouver. Vancouver Island, as a matter of fact. Wow, that's he cool. Call himself CND Bob. <laughs> his, his name is Bob, too. And OG Skywatch is from the Central Oregon Coast. Hi there, Ashara. Diamond Head, Mississippi. No, yes. Diamond Head, Mississippi? Wow. Ashara Jade. DK is in Columbus, Ohio. Daisy and Zoe Amethyst are in Delaware. Wonderful. You see, takes all kinds. Takes all kinds. And I'm in Connecticut, but the telescope that you're seeing this from is in Arizona. And Daryl is in Colorado. Yep. <clears throat> yep. I was just in Colorado. No, uh, just last week I was in Colorado, right? Was it last week? I had to do a talk in Colorado. I did a, I taught astronomy in the desert in Arizona. Before that, I went to the observatory to fix the problem that we now no longer suffer from, which means I get very little sleep. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, and uh, Mike C here is also in Minnesota. That's cool. Thanks, CND boy. Happy Thanksgiving to USA. Yep. All right. This is going to be exciting. This is a 50 second exposure of the Andromeda Galaxy. <clears throat> if you look, okay, a lot of people are from crazy places, you know? I mean, we have, uh, hey, uh, Rascally is here. Hi, Rascally. And he's near Ottawa. <laughs> um,. We have people from Australia. We have people from Bangkok. David Schmidt. Okay. Uh, James Dugan is here usually from Australia. Uh, but that's when we when we actually go a little earlier. Uh, unfortunately, he can't go... Um, he can't uh, watch us at the time we're doing now because we're basically on the West Coast hours now. You know? Look at that. There's the Andromeda Galaxy. Uh, we're going to correct it. Look at this. Look at this. You tell me. Worth the wait or what? Huh? Huh? Look when, at this. When you had that uh, image, it was sort of cranked up too high. It was very blue a minute ago. Yeah. Uh, that one object at the lower right really stood out. This here? Yes. Yeah, that's uh, probably an OB association. Uh, OBs, OB stars, o, o stars and B stars. Very hot and very blue, the O stars are. <clears throat> wow. And this is just stunning. Let's, um, let's try something here. Um, if we were to bring this up, if we were to actually... Uh, let's dare to undo this for a second. Undo that color change and then set a color balance uh, that's not gonna work maybe this will do it that's what we had before well let's just increase the blue and anything that's blue is gonna stand out a little more I see something with Andromeda okay. here that we've noted uh, one or two other times. Uh, I think when we looked at NGC 253 uh, the other night, uh, you you remarked that it looked like the right end of the spiral had a different Warped. appearance than the, than the left end does. Yes. And kind of, kind of see that here too. Yeah. Well, remember, and 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 Daryl knows this, but for you guys. Uh, Measure 31 here is 2 million light years away, heading for us, by the way. And this here is, is it Measure 110? Yes. M110, and this is Measure 32? 
Yes. So we have a elliptical galaxy and an elliptical galaxy, and these are companion galaxies to the Andromeda galaxy. So undoubtedly, the Andromeda galaxy has been subject to the gravitational tugging caused by these galaxies, which orbit it. Okay, so that could be responsible for warping the disk here a little bit. Uh, and you know what? Our disk might be warped too. Oh, C and D boy, don't you even go there. <laughs> yes, these dust lanes are beautiful. They're just really, really beautiful. <clears throat> okay, so let's uh, increase our black level just a little bit to try and add some contrast between these lanes and that's too much here we go pull it back a little bit okay I guess that's about right that one's just too much I gotta I want to come in one level one layer okay that's what I want you'll notice this down here this, these blue area, these are, again, hot young stars forming in the disk location of the stars. Science Bob says, I love the dust lanes. You, yeah, these are dust lanes. In our galaxy, we have them too. Here we call them dark nebula. Well, these are dark nebula there. It's just that they're in the Andromeda galaxy. You know, really, really pretty. <clears throat> yeah, I've said before, very, very uh, beautiful. In our yeah. galaxy, it's, it's like uh, seeing the great rift along the Milky Way up between yeah. uh, Cygnus and uh, Altair, or Aquila. Yeah, yep, yep. When we see uh, M32 and M110 there, you might say they're kind of analogous to uh, the large and small Magellanic Clouds uh, satellite galaxies yeah. to uh, Milky Way. That's right. That's where I was going with that before. I didn't finish the thought. But if you look here, you can actually see this, this blue area now a little bit more pronounced. Okay, there's a similar one up here uh -huh. in the galaxy. And a similar one right here. You know, I think a Measure 33 is going to be just as spectacular tonight. I think we should image that too. Jesus, this is beautiful. This is only seven stacked images. Yeah, we're in the neighborhood. In fact, those two galaxies probably have interacted, which is also a reason why this, this disk may have some kind of warp to it. Yep. Um, and why we see so many H2 regions in M33. That's right, because the they measure 31 here, this star, this, this is a massive island universe, okay? And we probably have about a trillion stars in this galaxy compared to ours, which has about 150 billion. Okay, so nearly 10 times, you know, as many stars as we have. So we're subject to its gravity. It's not subject to ours in terms of whether it's destructive to us. Um, it won't be destructive to us. We'll pass right through each other, but we'll get, we'll get, worse, we'll get the worst for the wear for it. Um, but again, it's not that not going to be that big a deal because we won't really uh, feel anything tremendously different. I mean, we're going to be just fine. The stars are so far from each other that they will literally pass through each other. Now, new orbits will happen. That the structure of the universe, I'm sorry, the structure of the galaxy will change. But it's definitely going to be a very interesting time. Gosh, I'd love to be around for that. See, uh, see, we zoom in here. See this right here? We got some very, very subtle dark lanes here. Um, and if you notice, right here, guess what that is? H2 That's an H2, it's an H2 region in the Andromeda galaxy. Yeah. Yeah. Double. And we see some beautiful star clusters in here. Individual uh stars can also almost be discerned here um which is kind of cool again uh, i think this is the best image of the andromeda galaxy we've ever seen here i just can, think it's uh, the best one we've in, ever can you seen look at, uh, 
110 up there in the upper right. Yeah, just a second. I want to come down to this OB association right here. Um, but we'll come back down to that, yes. We'll go up to what I mean. Okay, so. If you look. This is the quintessential hot young star formation region. Look at that. Yeah, we can clearly see hot young stars forming there. I mean, we are now in the galaxy. For all intents and purposes, we're in the galaxy. And we're not even at full frame right now. If we want to go even farther, this is 100%. This is the native resolution of this camera. You tell me. It ain't bad, is it? It's really good. You know? Would that, oh, so the there you can see all these stars. Younger or older than that H2 region we saw? H2 region. Uh, first. I would think that this, uh, well, the H2 region is made by uh, young stars. <clears throat> but the OB stars, the OB associations are generally a few million years old. You know, they're generally a few million years old because you've got an awful lot of hot young stars forming. O and B stars don't last very long. They last a few million years to a few tens of millions of years. As opposed to the many billions of years that our stars, our star lasts. So if you look at this, it's crazy. It's just beautiful. You know, I'm zooming in now. We're at 125%, 150%. And Wouldn't as we get in more, to, look at this. Would it be fair to say that the H2 region was the nursery and that the OB association is preschool? You know, the that the stars, the kids have been born, <clears throat> and after they left the H2 region, you get the OB association. Seems well, they, they may not have left the... Yeah, yeah, it, that's correct, but you may not have, well, you may not not have actually leave, not left... Well, it turned into the OB association. Right, right, because here's more H2 regions right here, okay? Right here. This guy right here has an H2 region in it right there. But what's funny is I can't believe I'm seeing all these things. But what's interesting, though, about this, and of course we have an artifact here from this is the traveling uh, pixels that happen when we have the, the thing is guiding. Uh, that one dead pixel can translate to a string of them. Um, so these stars are so hot and young that they have very, very powerful stellar winds, and those stellar winds will push away gas and dust from which they formed. So only a certain number of these stars will form before they start dispersing their own nebula. Okay, look at this H2 region right here. Look at that beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay, now let's go up to your M30, I'm sorry, M110 up here. That OB association look at that. stood out so much. Uh, yeah. On. Yeah. Now one thing about these guys is there's very little gas and dust in these. Okay, these elliptical galaxies have very, very little gas and dust. I do see a weird shadow here and here. Yes. And I'm, I'm wondering what that is. I wonder if it's actually uh, some rare dark nebula that might be in there. I doubt it, though. These ellipticals don't usually, ha don't usually have that. When I see M110, I always think it looks like uh, almost like a small spiral without the spiral that maybe yeah. the gravitational interaction has uh, changed its appearance. And when you look at M32 Possibly. right there on the far left, uh, <clears throat> mm -hmm. how different it looks than uh, M110 does. Yeah. I guess well, you call this, that look elliptical at, also. But, uh, yeah, it is elliptical, yeah. Look at this beautiful... There's beautiful knots of gas and, and, and dust mostly in here. It, it's resolved. This is just gorgeous. Uh, we've never had this stuff resolved to, to this level before in this, in, this, in this galaxy. Never before. So this is really going to be a spectacular image. Gosh, this is gorgeous. And this beautiful H2 region here, a very complicated region. Look at that. Let's zoom in on that. Okay, we're at 100 158% right now. Look at that. And just to show you, we'll, we'll zoom out just to show you 
where we're coming from, okay? Here's where we're coming from. And we were zooming in so tight on this. That's the kind of the kind of detail that this this uh, system supports now. I'm stunned. Absolutely stunned. Wow. And the colors look nice too. The color render rendering is good. This is 16 stacked images. We're not even up to 20 yet, and it's just beautiful. We don't have to go to 20. Uh, that the, gas region that we're looking at is probably two million plus light years, uh, CND boy. That whole. I'm sorry. Go ahead. End of the spiral there on the bottom right. That just really jumps out now. It does. Yeah. It does. And now that I'm not concerned about zooming in, I mean, look at this. Look at this blue. These, these blue stars in here. Extremely hot. Uh, no, Science Bob, this is the 294MC Pro camera that we're using. That's the ASI 294MC Pro. Okay, so resolution here I'll show you uh, is under capture and format information. If you look here, you'll see the resolution. Okay. It's 4144 by 2822. Just beautiful. <clears throat> yeah, this is beautiful down here. The details are just... Um, I don't know. Oh, look at CND. Hubble got nothing on us here. Actually, it's got a lot on us, CND, but thanks. You know, uh, we we are below an atmosphere. I wish we were above it. You know what? The time will come when we'll be actually accessing telescopes that are in, you know, orbit around the Earth. I, I, I see that happening. Ooh. God, that's just beautiful. That shows, too, again, what we said, that when you look at the center of Andromeda, it's much yellower than the, the outskirts, like that, that lower right uh, mm -hmm. end of the spiral yeah. arm. So yeah, you've got all the old, old yellow stars in the middle and uh, the mm -hmm. hot young blue stars out the outskirts. Only because that's where the new stars are formed. So they tend to have more of a, a blue population in the a, more of a blue population than the spiral arms. Yeah. That's something else. Oh, man. I really want to see M33 now. I, I'm going to jump in there. I, I'm i going to go to 20 here. Um, I, this last one, and then we're going to go to um, uh, Measure 33 and Triangulum. And that's a... Uh, 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 more open spiral. I think it's going to be stunning tonight. Look at the sky. Look at this sky. This is absolutely beautiful. The best we've ever seen in Andromeda. The best we've ever seen it ever. Ever. Okay, 20. Wow. I just absolutely love this. This is phenomenal. Okay. The stack has been saved. And then we're saving this exactly as seen. And that's been saved. So now we can clear this. I know. Seems sinful to clear it. But we're going to clear it and go on to measure 33. And then you'll forget all about Andromeda when you see this one. Okay. Um, let's go down and grab a one second exposure. We're doing 50 seconds too. We're going to do the same thing for measure 33. Hey Ronald. Ronald's here. ERRT radio on Mixler. Beautiful. Okay. I'm glad you saw the Andromeda before we, uh, before we went on. And now let's go. Let's see how high measure 33 is. Okay. 33. 
that's measure 31 and 33 is going to be right near it There it is. Oh, wow, it's almost directly overhead. This is be by far even better than Andromeda in terms of being able to see it good. Okay, it's almost straight up. It's going to be beautiful. I know, Leslie, but it's straight up in the air. It's directly straight up, so that's the best seeing. We're looking at through the least atmosphere. So this is going to be the... If... if if all goes well, this will be the best version of M33 we've ever seen, ever. It's literally almost directly overhead. Ronald says hi. Yeah, I said hi. Hello, okay. Ronald. And there's that little galaxy right next to uh, Mirage right there, that little tiny galaxy. I mean, that little tiny galaxy is just a, a waypoint for us, you know, in terms of finding this. Um, other galaxy, but imagine how much life might be in that galaxy. I'm just astonished by that possibility. Wow. Even this raw shot is just stunning. Okay. We're going to do 50 seconds again, because that seems to be the sweet point. And I'm excited to do this. This is going to be really good. Oh, yeah. Okay, so let's check it out. Mystery music. What are we going to see? Here it comes. And go. Oh. Disappointment. What? Disappointment. We have a guiding error on this one frame. We're going to fix that. I'll show you what I mean. If I go to 100%, you'll see the stars. The stars have a little streak to them, see? Yeah. I might have... Oh, it's going to be beautiful, though. I think what I did was I ended up probably doing it before we actually had our guide star. Yeah. I got too anxious, too excited. All right, so let's try it again. Start over. Ah, starting over. Starting over. And... There we go. Wow. This is beautiful. We're seeing detail in this supernova remnant here. Yes. Wow. Amazing. Look at this. And this noise goes away, as, you, as we've seen before, as we go further along. Look at this remnant. Holy cow. That almost looks like a mini, uh, a mini veil. Look at this. It's like a mini veil. Incredible. There's a lot going on in that one farther to the right, too, a little higher up. This one here? No, to the lower, to the lower right of that. Oh, all this? Yeah. yeah. Jeez, look at this! Holy cow! Oh man, this is just so absolutely. Again, this is the best it can possibly look. And the big H two region at uh, ten o'clock. Yeah, we're getting Yeah, we're getting lots of detail on that too. 
<clears throat> Look at that. And see, we have another one here. Okay. This is another star forming region. There's a star forming region here. There's one here. One there with some dark nebula associated with it. Dark nebula, dark nebula, dark nebula with H2 and there and there. H2. Uh, it's just endless. There's just so much stuff going on here. Wow. And I think you said earlier that uh, the uh, H2 regions and the uh, <coughs> supernova remnants and such, all that uh, could be because M33 got s stirred up when uh, it inter inter uh, gravitationally interacted with uh, M31 in the past. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's very true. It very could have. Very well could have. And it's not wound. Yes, yeah, CND. These these are good. These are good views, CND. There's no doubt about it. I mean, this this galaxy we're looking at. Um, it almost looks like the Hubble shots when, the Hubble. When the Hubble was actually uh, myopic and needed glasses, except uh, we have a little better sight than that. <laughs> green blob on the right, supernova remnant, I guess. Uh, that thing must be huge. This one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's certainly the color Just... of well, three. Uh, that looks almost too big. Got another what one does? There. Yeah, this one. I mean, look at look at the detail in this guy here, and and in this here. Look at this this modeling detail. This is just crazy. Wow. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna go into my enhancement here, <clears throat> and I'm gonna just bring us up a, a bit. Let's go to 1.5 again. And the enhancement, I want to try and grab a few more bits of detail out of this. Oh yeah, look at that. Uh, Ronald, if you're talking about just the overall color, everything that's blue in this image is a star. Uh, at its tiniest. They're star clouds. Okay. Um, these patches here, and here, uh, these patches like that and that, these patches are patches like the Orion Nebula in our galaxy, the the uh, Carina Nebula like in our galaxy, um, and then the green ones are supernova remnants, okay? If you look, you can see detail in some of these remnants. In fact, there's more out further if we go over. Um that are outside and I want to see if I can find the one I'm thinking of there there's one there it is there's one right there you can see this one is, is way it's a sort of outside a spiral arm yeah it's really not um, but ah uh, I mean it's like we've never been able to do deep dives on a galaxy before with Sky Tour live stream, but now we can actually just deep dive it, you know. You have a dimmer one there to the upper right of NC604 that actually has a lot of detail in it. This, this, nope. or this? Nope. Uh, just to the right of uh, NC604. Okay, right here. Uh, go to the upper right at about two o'clock from 604. That right there. Well, this right here? Yeah, see, it's not as bright, but oh, okay. how modeled all that is. Looks clumpy. Yeah, no, that's definitely. Yeah. 
<clears throat> I'm just loving the detail here. Look at this. You know, when we had taken pictures before, this was just a blob. These are just green blobs, featureless blobs. And that has changed. I can't believe, I can't believe how gorgeous this is. Wow. I just can't believe how gorgeous it is. It's just, just absolutely stunning. And as you see here, this guy here, this is a remnant at the very end of a spiral arm. And then here, an H2 region at the very end of a spiral arm. Just, uh, and look at this. That's an odd looking thing. That looks like a, looks like a definite Almost like a supernova, uh, a shell. Yes. But it may not be. I have to. I have to check that out. I have to find out what the name of that is. The thing is that this galaxy has so many interesting things in it, guys. That many of these are named. You know, like as Daryl said, NGC six hundred four, NGC or New General Catalog objects are only usually used uh, in, for naming things in our galaxy. You know, clouds of gas, clouds of dust, and all that stuff, and H2 regions, you know, stellar nurseries. But here, we're doing this. We're calling these, we're, we're naming these things, too. Things like this right here, you know what that is? That's a globular cluster. That's a globular cluster. That's a globular cluster. These are globular clusters in this other galaxy. We're seeing the globular clusters. We started the night with measure 2, the globular cluster. And wow. we're seeing more of those globular clusters in this galaxy as well. Absolutely astonishing. I'm going to find and post a link to an APOD from a while back. I think I've shared it before. It, uh, okay. It's a close-up view of M33 and it identifies uh, like 20 different uh, objects inside M33. Yeah, we should actually have it side by side here. Really stunning. I want to try and do another enhancement. We're going to go to two. 21 objects. Isn't this amazing, guys? Is this amazing? You can see the spiral arms very clearly, you know. And this spiral galaxy is not as tightly wound up, so we have designations for these. There's a capital S to say spiral, and then an S, you know, capital S with a little A is a very tightly wound spiral. A capital S with a little B, as in boy is a less tightly wound spiral, like the Andromeda Galaxy is an SB type galaxy. An SC, S with a little c, is this galaxy. These are galaxies that have uh, uh, less structure in their spiral arms, more loose. And that's what we're looking at here. Just look at that. Oh my gosh, I don't know what to say. It's like I close my eyes, I open them, it's still there. It's like, wow. It's really happening. Just such a beautiful sight. Jeez. I've never taken such really, really good professional shots before with this, you know, system. It's found its home. You know. And it wouldn't be here without Marianne in the chat. She's actually one of the primary movers of Sky Tour West. Okay, I posted a link to that A pod. Uh, if okay. you look at that, uh, item number 15 is NGC 604. Uh, yep. In the A pod image, it's at 3 o'clock from the center of the galaxy. So it's rotated as compared to what Mark is seeing. 
and it, it, well that uh, just that just means that it means that the camera that took the picture is rotated slightly yes yes yeah yeah because because people might think that the galaxy's rotation between that picture and this one uh, is moved it that far and it has not Look at this. Look at this. Oh. Hello, Sue Ellen Hating. How are you? You're in Colorado? Excellent. So is Daryl. I was just in Colorado uh, teaching people uh, astronomy and UFOs. We're talking about extraterrestrial life. Because I'm an astronomer. My specialty is exoplanets and uh, the potential for life on other worlds surrounding some of these stars that are more habitable than others oh my gosh this is only getting better and better and better man look at it let's try to see what happens if i just do an auto process section here okay Hey, Timothy Cook, how you doing? Well, thanks for coming out, man. And thanks for hanging with us. You have a good night. I can see it's time for your bedtime. Yeah, I get it. Um, mine too. <laughs> Alright, let's just back this off just a tad. Alright, let's see how that looks. Wow. My God! Ah. Here's one of those that's way outside the galaxy. Of course, it may not be outside the galaxy. If I can just bring the black level down, you might still see where it goes. All right, Timothy. Hey, thanks, man. You have a good night, okay? Come back. Make sure you subscribe. And do the thumbs up thing. Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. Signing off. All right. Thanks, man. Thanks, brother, for coming out. <clears throat> kind of ruffled area. Uh, well, when you went whole screen there. What's that? It, it's below center now. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> sit still. It's above center right. now. It's got the very red star to the left of it. To the right. Or excuse Here? me. To the left. To the left. To the this? left. That right there. Oh yeah. That's another. That's another uh, young hot bunch of stars. Yeah. Look at this detail here. Jeez, it's just like I want to zoom in on that now. It's like I gotta see that. I literally feel like we can dive in to this galaxy far deeper than ever, ever before. I mean, it's almost like, is it a galaxy at all? You know? There's looks really on good. Yeah. Look at this rich area right there. That just... Blah. Yeah. Hmm. One thing, folks, when you look at all this, uh, anything you see that looks like a star, that's actually a foreground object. That's in our galaxy. Yeah, these like these are stars in our galaxy, and we're looking past them to uh, just over 2 million light years beyond. So the light coming from this galaxy is just over 2 million years old as well. But the light coming from these stars is probably just a few hundred to a few thousand years old I mean they're in our galaxy <clears throat> okay that's 20 stacked images of the Triangulum Galaxy I think that's tremendous I think that's enough alright we're gonna be messing with that okay so we're gonna save this now hey Keisha Fowler's here hi 
Hi, Keisha. Long time no see. I know. A Didi showed up too, actually. I saw Didi the other day. Me too. Yeah. Yeah, you were with us. Okay. Uh, okay, let's take a last look. Last look. And then we're going to head to the next object. Wow. Absolutely beautiful. Wow. Hmm. Look at the detail in these. They, uh, we're going to be drawing out all kinds of detail. If this is going to be worth a post with just the details seen in this galaxy. No doubt about it. Wow. Okay. We'll leave that there. It'll come. We'll 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 clear it in a little bit. All right. So. Okay. Okay. And here's our dynamic uh, view here. Our our one second view. Right there. All right. Let's see where we're going to go now. It's almost like since we're here, we got to like, we got to like look at some nebulae that might be nearby here. I don't think we have any. I mean, the heart always. I was thinking maybe we'll just. I was thinking about some dark nebula, but um, it's okay. We got plenty in the heart nebula. Let's go check that out. Okay. Telescope's heading to the heart nebula. That's got to be one of those uh, Stellarium names. I can't imagine. Galileo look up in the sky and goes, oh, I'll call that a lawnmower. Back in Galileo. Oh, a lawnmower, day, yeah. He, that, <laughs> yeah. he would have called that a sheep nebula. You know, yeah, because those are the lawnmowers. Yeah. Wow. So we're going through the heart? Yeah. That's okay. a good jumping off place. It is 12.05. We've been doing this for three hours, three minutes. Okay. So now you'll see the nebula show up as a cloudy patch here. Can't miss that. The night is a very nice night. All right. And I think... We'll just move it over a little bit and then we'll start our exposure. <clears throat> Fish head at upper right. That's right. Always That's reminds right me here. of uh, the fish head on my little fish sculpture. <laughs> Looks a lot like it. Yeah. Okay, we're going to do 55 seconds on this. All right. And we should have our guide star right now. We're going to clear this. That was beautiful. These are going to be some really, really beautiful images to take down from the server site, by the way. Where's the server? The server can be found if you go to my Facebook page, Mark D'Antonio. It's pinned at the top. Uh, it's a OneDrive public server. And if you go to SkyTour Livestream on Facebook, you can find it pinned there too. 
I'll um, post the link. Oh, you got the link? Excellent. And then, if not, you can just check out this chat and go to the link that Daryl's going to post. Okay. Uh, it's way down in my favorites. So I have to find it first. <laughs> All right. All right. Be ready, folks. This is going to knock your socks off. Haha. <laughs> Uh, okay, see, I did it before I got the guide star. Okay, here's Mark's server. Uh, it's the Sky Tour live stream server. There you go. Thank you, Daryl. When you click on that, it takes you right to a OneDrive public server. It's read-only. And you can go and see all the folders for all the nights we've done uh, things. Uh, uh, I don't. Uh, Isabella asked a question about the Heart Nebula. I don't understand about the Heart Nebula. Is it empty in the middle or, or it's the far side of the... Uh, what is the general construction? Um, Leslie, that actually does look like a big red sea turtle with the head here and the flippers and the shell. Uh, Isabella, to answer your question, um, this is the hot young. This is the hot young cluster in here, and to some extent, this cluster has high stellar winds that are are clearing the center, and these stars will actually form a cavity. Uh, where they form, all right, and we could be seeing some of that. Yes. Oh man, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Mm-hmm. I think that our color render is good, but I'm gonna just give it a little shot. See what we get. That's actually a little better. And then let's do a little. There we go. Brings out some more data in the middle. That middle that you're talking about. See all these many stars. This is just a stunning location. This is the fish head nebula up here. Okay. Fish has lips. Yeah. You see and the other thing to line. notice, right here. That's what reminds me of my fish. That has mm. gills just like that. Has lips like that too. Yeah. Now one thing to understand too, guys, is this. If you look at these up close, and we're already pushing in pretty close because this is a very low noise camera. Uh, look at this beautiful, beautiful squiggle, Daryl. Look at this. Look at that. Sort of like Bellers of Creation again. We see I that over have and never... Over. Yeah, we've talked about this many times. Okay, when you look at, uh, at these things, when you look at what happens in these nebulae, okay, um, you'll see that there is an area that's dense. Okay, a dense area of material that's forming. And then hot stars are hitting it with stellar radiation. And they tend to, with their stellar winds, they tend to push away the loose stuff, the stuff that isn't gravitationally bound. So dust will go away, some gas will go away. And again, in the same way that stars clear a cavity around them, they clear that material. But sometimes there's dense knots of it, and the stars can't clear that. So those become areas that are uh, gravitational foci, gravitational focuses where objects can co coalesce and condense in there. And as they get denser, then the stellar winds have even less chance of pushing them apart and moving them away. And that's kind of what we're seeing here, all right? And they tend to be radially uh, arranged away from the hot stars. Okay, so for instance, we go over here and we see these guys radially arranged out from the hot stars in the center of this cluster. Uh, but, you know, because the universe is in 3D, we don't know exactly 
which stars are doing that moving okay some of the stars that could be doing doing that uh moving could actually be like literally this star right here could be doing that to this you know or this star could be doing that it doesn't have to be this star okay this star might be much closer than the nebula it might not even be in a nebula you know there's, so there's a, a lot star. going on whoops uh before you moved yeah, uh, when you see I'm those two that now. were in near the center of the image, the one skinny one, okay, uh, right there. Uh, when you see that curly skinny one that you're at there, uh, uh -huh. if you follow up the direction that's pointed, it's pointed at that star that's above center. Uh, I mean Both this one? This, that star? Yeah, this one. Yeah, this one looks like it's pointing to there. Yeah. So maybe and it's responsible for one, evaporating this. Is also pointing that direction. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll we'll see a lot of that. We'll see a lot of that, you know. Um. Pillars of yeah, creation. Yeah, uh, Yeah, it's like the pillars of creation. Yeah. Oh gosh, I can't wait to see all that now. Got to wait till summer now. We stacked six here so far. Look at the the knots, the knots and convolutions in here. Just beautiful. Look at this right here. Look, I'm gonna zoom in on that. Looks like it has eyes glowing in the I know, dark. right? It looks like a little bug. Yeah, this reminds me of the. Uh, it reminds me of those things in the in the Matrix that were seeking out the the uh, well, the Sentinels. They were seeking out the uh, the ship. Yeah. Yeah. Look at that. Like That's something else. Here, yeah. Let's go here and try to increase our contrast a little bit. Sorry guys, I just yawned again. I might have... Uh... Let's see how this fleshes out. I'm gonna... I'm gonna go full screen on this again. We're gonna fit it all to screen. What do we got? Ah, look at that. Holy cow. Wow. Um, let's process back to standard look at that uh. I think our colors might have changed a little Wow Oof. I mean how do you deny this beauty Spock I can't say enough about it it's it's beautiful fascinating captain Fascinating. I sort of see Mae West in that image. <laughs> I'm with Leslie. I see a, I see a sea turtle. I see There's that. There's the too, head. Sure. There's the flippers, and the shell. Uh, the upper part of the, the heart is right here. Yes. That upper part of the heart looks like a woman wearing a. Uh, oh. Sort of, a, a, you know, that's like her bosom. She's wearing a fancy uh, dress. I knew you were gonna say that. <laughs> yeah, I see that. And that lower that. part looks sort of like her hips. No, I guess so. These are the hips. Yeah, that's one. That's the other one. Yeah. Wow. Not necessarily May West, really, but uh, <clears throat> you get the drift yeah. of it. I do. Very cool. I wonder, wow. you look like this you have is... another star cluster over on the left edge. 
We do. There's another star cluster here. And that's foreground to what we're seeing in the nebula. Yeah, it could so. be. Let's actually go in here and see what that cluster is. And remember, these things are going to be backwards to us now. Because the telescope is tipped back with their head back. So they're going to be kind of upside down. Okay, so it's on the opposite side of the fish head. You know you've arrived when your images are better than this atlas that you're using. Fish heads here, and the cluster that we're looking at is on the opposite side, so... Probably NGC 1027 there. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at right there, yeah. That's right. It depends how much it says they have in them. Fifty to one hundred stars. Yeah, that's it. What? Open star cluster. It says. Yeah. Yes, sirree. Wowie, wow. Okay, that's beautiful. When you're Let's done with the heart, you have here. to do the soul. Yes, I do. Sure. Yeah. Well, especially at the length of time we're doing, because we're doing 50 second stacks. Okay. Let's go back here. Look at that. Wow. Ah. Amazing. Hi, Roxybot. Of course you do. There <laughs> <clears throat> you, know, you go, Roxybot. M M77 is one we need to look at sometime. Yeah. That's the one up near uh, Alpha SETI. When we yeah. looked at uh, uh, NGC 253 earlier, that's mm -hmm. at the far end of uh, Cetus. Yeah. And the tail. And okay, we're gonna. M77 is near its uh, head. Okay. All right, this is an 11 total time is 11 minutes 55 seconds, so 12 minutes on this. So we saved it. We're going to save it exactly as seen, and then we'll go to the Soul Nebula. The Soul Nebula. Okay, and then we'll clear that later. Gorgeous, okay. Go to one second. And we're gonna carry on. Carry on my wayward son. <clears throat> All right. I hate that song. And, uh, <laughs> <coughs> I, liked, I liked the band. Kansas back in the day. I saw them in concert once uh, off their third album, I think it was. It was a great concert. And when they okay. did uh, that album, uh, uh, I forget what it's called, Left Overture or whatever, that, uh, yeah. I thought it was kind of a commercial sellout. Carry on my really? words. Uh, Dust in the Wind and all that stuff. I hated that album. Hmm. First three albums are great. Yeah. That's when they really got big, though. And they went commercial and sold out. Mm hmm. Excuse me a moment. <clears throat> okay. We'll be doing okay. the soul by the time you come back. We're moving across to the soul. You notice how all the noise goes away when he, he mutes his mic? He's got some kind of electrical noise going on there with his cables or whatever so that's why you're hearing that high pitch sound sometimes like high pitch cycling of something let's just actually hmm? oh duh okay here we go alright and now let's say 
we're gonna do this a little bit with a little bit more panache. Here we go. Gonna move faster now. Okay, and then move south, I believe. Yeah, and then we'll have the Soul Nebula. Of course, that's too far. All right. I want to thank you guys for coming out tonight. We have had a wonderful time. I've had a good time with you guys. All right, so now we should be able to see the Soul Nebula. There it is. <clears throat> okay, and then we're going to move it to the west a little bit. Okay. And just a little bit more south. All right. Now we'll wait the 11 seconds to get our guide star. Otherwise, our first one will be screwed up. And we'll go 55 seconds on this again. And we should have a guide star by now. So let's go. We'll live stack and we'll clear the last image of the heart nebula. Look at that beautiful nebula. Mm. Wow. And it's like you can't get enough of that, you know? It's just beautiful. Look at that. Mm. I'll clear it before the green progress bar gets all the way across. So many things to show you in there that we just have so much fun with. Okay. Okay, so. Stack has been cleared in preparation for the new one. And we have 10 seconds. <clears throat> Three, two, one, zero, and... Soul Nebula. Pow. Look at that. Wow. That's just beautiful. Not quite aligned well enough. <clears throat> I could have gone over a little bit more. But, yeah, I could. I can try it. Let's see if it can align. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll just clear it and start again. I see a bosom on that one, too. My gosh. <laughs> You're seeing too many bosoms. All right, let's clear that. Let's see where it puts us now. All right, it should be moved over now. Haha. <laughs> Right, because I was moving it. Yeah. Um, not quite enough. I gotta... Let's do this. Alright. So let's... Let's go here. And... Get rid of this. <clears throat> okay. We'll align it before we take the pictures. <clears throat> there we go. Here that's 
pretty pretty cool uh, just drop us down a little bit okay then move it over a little more still okay that's good wow Vera thank you Vera Lucia Campos from Brazil Thank you so much. It's very, very kind of you. She's been here. I think I saw her earlier, actually. Okay. 55 seconds. It's cute animation, Vera. Yeah, very nice. That's sweet of you to... to Help us out, Vera. Thank you so much. Now we'll go in here and empty this live stack. You know, I'd, I'd be lying if I didn't say that helps because I pay for the extra OneDrive storage <coughs> to... to put these up there on the server so that's very kind thank you that helps me take care of the infrastructure Gotta take care of the infrastructure I have no choice yeah oh bad internet today Vera I'm sorry here let's Okay, and pow. Oh, yeah. Now, you want to see Star Trains, Daryl. Here, look. I know. I must have infected uh, Isabella's thinking because she was asking about star lines now. Mm -hmm. In fact, she posted the question a minute ago. She mm -hmm. says, do you think those long lines of stars may be a result of gravitational waves? Parentheses, not gravity waves. <clears throat> um, We've talked about that before some. I, I've wondered about that. You, uh, I've seen lines of stars like along the edges of uh, parts of the Veil Nebula. Uh, if it might not have been yeah. from a shockwave moving through or something of the sort. That That's actually the theory. You know, the, the suggestion that I would offer up is that maybe we're looking at shock fronts that are moving through from ancient supernovas and the snowplow material you know, into each other and as they snowplow the material into each other they can start a successive wave of star formation uh, at a galaxy level those those are called starburst galaxies where they just get this burst of star formation <clears throat> you know yeah So I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say gravitational waves for this, Isabella. Density um, waves. No, I, I think it's. Um, let's see, d density waves are a different thing altogether. I mean, um, a traffic jam is a density wave by definition. Okay, what's that mean? If we look at a spiral arm of a galaxy, right, and we we know that there's spiral arms. And they're full of stars. But those spiral arms, they never wind up, do they? Right? You'd think that when they're, they're shaped like that, the way they're, they're shaped, they should sort of twist up and get tighter and tighter and tighter as the galaxy rotates. But they do not. So they rotate more like a rigid disk. But the spiral arms themselves are known as uh, the formation of the spiral arms is due to what we call density waves. And, for instance, uh, you're in the traffic chopper looking down at the highway. You know, it's like, from here on the, in, in, in Air 1, we're looking at the traffic jam down below on the highway. Uh, we see these red cars moving into the traffic jam, and then they go slow down, and then they move out of the traffic jam. So the cars coming in slow down and get held up by the uh, by the traffic jam, but then they move out of the traffic jam, but the traffic jam's still there. It's just different cars every time. 
as cars slow down and move through. It's different cars each time. That's what a galaxy spiral arm is. The stars in the galaxy spiral arm are not the same. Yeah, you know, as time goes on, they're not the same because they move through the spiral arms. But as they move through, there's uh, there's an area where there's many many stars, and what happens is the others get slowed down by gravity, tugged around, and then eventually move through, and so they're moving through the spiral arms. They're not constrained to the spiral arms. That's and that explains why the, the why the spiral arms don't don't wind up because of the fact that the stars are constantly orbiting the galaxy. All right. And as they orbit the galaxy, uh, the spiral arms just stay there, and the stars move through them. The See? density waves themselves still, they're actually spiraling around the galaxy, aren't they? Uh, I'm not sure if the density waves are actually moving. I think the density waves might be stuck there. I was under the impression um, that they were moving, uh, creating the spiral separate... arms from them, in a sense. Yeah, they, they could be. I mean, there's a few trains of thought, but I think that the primary train of thought is that um, the spiral arms, the density waves, are moving, but not at the same rate as the stars. It's a very different. It's a different rate for those density waves. Those have their own their, their own schedule, <laughs> so to speak. So I think that. You're you're saying the right thing, I actually, but I think that the the density waves are actually, um, they're a phenomenon that's actually not. Um, we can't really show it directly. We can just just take pictures and say, look at the galaxy, look at the spiral arms. But the density waves are moving. Um, they have to be moving uh, to some extent because we see that they at the outside edges of the galaxy they trail back, right? And they lead at the forward ends near the near the nucleus, so something's causing them to do that trailing, and it has to do with rotation for sure. But um, they aren't winding up. Once they form, that density wave stays there. The traffic jam is a cosmic catastrophe of traffic jams. It'll never go away unless the galaxies collide, in which case all the density waves are disrupted, and the stars move. Uh, in new paths altogether. <clears throat> this is the Soul Nebula. I'm going to call it the Bikini Top Nebula. Dear God. That's kind of funny. Well, look at it. I don't know, okay. Daryl. What's going on with you? You've got May West in the other one. You've got a bikini top here, you know? <laughs> no, well, it's November, you know. Uh, <laughs> That's funny. Density wave theory. This is Wikipedia, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, density wave theory or the Lin Shu density wave theory. Proposed by C.C. Lynn and Frank Shu in the mid-60s to explain the spiral arm structure of spiral galaxies. Uh, theory introduces the idea of long-lived quasi-static spiral structure. In this hypothesis, the spiral pattern rotates in a particular angular frequency pattern speed, whereas the stars in the galactic disk are orbiting at a different speed depending on yep. their distance to the galaxy center. The presence of spiral density waves in galaxies has implications on the star formation since the gas orbiting around the galaxy may be compressed and forms shock periodically. Theoretically, the formation of global spiral pattern is treated as an instability of the stellar disk caused by the self-gravity as opposed to tidal interactions. Uh, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> yeah, so we we're saying the same kinds of things. Uh, one illustration, they have several illustrations there. Uh, one uh, 
simulation of a galaxy with a simple spiral arm pattern. Although the spiral arms do not rotate, the galaxy does. If you watch closely, you will see stars moving in and out of the spiral arms as time progresses. Right. Anyway. Yeah, well, you see, well, that's why I said that they don't, they don't actually rotate, uh, at least not in the same way as the stars do. The stars have their own orbit, and the spiral arms are doing something completely different. Um, they're big static structures, as they said, and that, that's actually, according to that theory, that's true. Check this out. We're zooming into the Sol Nebula. Okay, this is 100%. Look at this beautiful tendril of black right here. See that? This tiny little area right here is an area probably where there's a condensing cloud, perhaps. really Over pretty there, on the left of that uh, it looks like you've got some that right there some uh, blue mixed in with the red like uh, reflection it does nebula. look like there might be it looks like there might be a uh, one of those reflection nebulas because we do have some dark stuff in here and that could be scattering some of the light from the nearby stars possibly this one just stunning I mean, I, I'm just, I'm fairly certain I'm going to be staring at these, these images for quite some time. There's so much going on in these images. We caught some good stuff, guys. No doubt about it. This is the Soul Nebula, part of the heart and soul. I don't know how many light years across it is, nor its distance. I'm going to guess its distance has got to be like 6,000 light years. Are you able to look that up to see how far away the soul is? Sure. And once again, here are these pillars that we see. These pillars are omnipresent in all of these many stellar nurseries where young cluster formed at the heart. There it is. Okay, spews out this ultraviolet light, which can go light years, and it can start eroding and causing these pillars. So the lightweight material gets pushed aside by the stellar winds. The high density locations like this and this and this, they literally shield what's behind them. And so they st it stays for a longer period of time anyway. According to Wiki, so take it with a grain of salt, 7,500 light years. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I figured at least 6,000. Yeah, it doesn't give a estimate of the size. I haven't seen it yet, anyway. Well, if you get the arc minute size, I can plug it into my program and figure it out. Uh, 150 minutes by 75. Okay, 150 minutes by 75. Two and a half by one <clears throat> degrees. Okay. Yeah. No, I, I. Let's try. Let me find my programs. There we go. Um. See, is this the program I want to use? This is the object in light years, let's say 7,500 light years. Nebula cluster, let's say nebula. Angular diameter in arc seconds. What do they say for this one? Uh, 150 minutes, or that'd be two and a half degrees. 
by okay. 75 minutes or one and a quarter degrees. Okay. 150 minutes? Uh-huh. Okay. All right. Want it in arc seconds? Give me a second and I'll tell you. It's going to be what, roughly 15,000? Stand by. Let's just multiply that in 30. Nine thousand. Okay. By uh I'll just do one size at a time. Okay. Okay, that's uh, that puts its diameter at three hundred and twenty seven light years across. Alright, and it would be half that on the short side. Right. So That's right. 100, 163 and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Big. Yeah, it's big. And the heart's even bigger. Heart's probably about the same distance. Let's see, we got uh, 16 stacked here. Let's go check out our favorite little location right up here because this is looking really, really good. Look at this. Do you see this? Wow. Look at that. That's beautiful. This is just so detailed. Wow. Okay. Okay. Beautiful. Well, you've done it again, folks. You have wasted another completely good night with Skytour livestream here tonight. Um, these images will all be up there for you to digest and take in. We still have our winter sky coming up. I can't stay up for that tonight, but boy oh boy, it's going to be beautiful. Um, and when we look at the objects in the winter sky, you're going to say, holy cow. We've got things like Thor's helmet. we got things like the Rosette Nebula. We've got the Andromeda, I'm sorry, we have the Orion Nebula. We have the Running Man Nebula. We have the Horse Head, the, the, the Flame Nebula. We have so many objects to look at. All right, we have the rubber stamp nebula. What's that? Hmm. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna disconnect the focuser because we don't need it. I'm we're going to. Oh yeah, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm. I mean, this this is the shutdown music, so I gotta shut down. <laughs> I know you don't. Uh -huh. All right. So I want to thank you guys for coming out and spending the evening with us. It's fantastic. We had a good time with you all, and uh, I'm hoping that you guys can come back again, and that come back again could be as soon as tomorrow. <laughs> we shall see. So now. Oh, uh, let's see. Oh, that's closed up. That's closed up. That's closed up. Okay. It is time to park the telescope. So, the telescope will get parked now. We hit park and we say go. We say park it away. The telescope will now move to its predetermined home location. And then it will be ready to be shut down. There we go. <clears throat> Gotta get out there to remove the spider webs from around the camera. Okay.
Okay, telescope is off. All right, now we can disconnect the telescope. Disconnect the camera. And shut that down. Shut this down. Now, there is the telescope in the building right now. And what we'll do is, since we're all ready to go here, I want to go here. And now we're going to shut the roof. Good night, telescope. Good night. Good night. Thank you for wonderful views tonight. It was just beautiful. Very much appreciate the attention to everybody here at Sky Tour Livestream tonight. Beautiful. Good night, everybody. Thanks for yeah, the stream. Yeah, we'll see you all. Yeah, this is really beautiful. We had some gorgeous stuff out there. Wow. Yeah. Indeed. All right, guys. Well, I want to thank you for coming. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Talk to you again. Have a good night. And we'll be back. Take see care. You. See you soon. Good night. <laughs>